this conference um this very timely uh, just the day before the nation is going to celebrate the um national science day and the theme of that uh, is uh, the future of science technology and innovation and uh, uh, that is something so appropriate uh, and very thoughtful of, of of the department of ece to have organized this conference just uh, a day before the national science day um i need not emphasize the importance of the discipline of electronics and communication uh, for sure the the electronic devices uh, are going to play a great deal uh, of role in future development of all uh, science and technology um, r and d as well as innovations um and uh, you would all agree that the this mind boggling human race has made over last 30 to 40 years uh, i think electronics or electronic devices have been uh, central to that progress uh, one of the reasons why the the human race has been able to make such enormous progress in in the uh, field of science and technology is the fact that uh, that there has been a great uh, continuous improvement as far as the the devices are concerned their characteristics are concerned uh, with better uh, response times with better storage uh, capacity all these devices are now uh, getting improved uh, by the day and uh, that has led to better uh, analytical instruments and uh, in turn that has enabled the scientific community or the engineering community to do better quality research even the indian government is now uh, seriously uh, uh, promoting the the fabrication uh, activity as well as uh, the electronic devices are concerned um, because uh, you know if you look at look around all the Uh, developed countries all the countries big economies of the world they are big manufacturers of the precision electronic devices and uh, i think uh, uh, if india has to become self reliant uh, uh, in a variety of sectors then it is important that uh, this field of electronics and electronic devices gets the impetus from the government uh and the attention of this uh, it deserves um the kind of progress this field has made is as i said this is absolutely uh, mind boggling uh, in the in my time when i was a student uh, way back in the late uh, 60s and early 70s uh, i recall my bsc days and msc days during 68 to 72 uh and since uh, this is a personal uh, i have just like to just mention a bit back then we i did my you know physics degree with a specialization in electronics and uh, some special courses on electronics were there and uh, the only electronics we learned was uh, you know the diodes and the triode and uh, a bit about pentodes um the transistors were just getting introduced and we did some experiments some basic experiments on transistors and uh, but most of the experiments were tube based uh we were also introduced just about with the digital uh, these gates uh and uh, a bit about the uh, microwave electronics uh, you know the plastron and Uh, rectangular wave guides we did some experiment on them but now but now uh, i i see uh, you know these laboratory experiments at masters level they have undergone tremendous transformation um, you have uh, in fact in my time also uh, in the late 70s uh, you know this mic the field of microelectronics started uh, getting a uh, lot of attention 
and then as you are all aware uh, you know better than i do microelectronics then has now given way to nanoelectronics and uh, there is um, this new field of molecular electronics quantum electronics and what have you so the the this field has actually uh, expanded uh, a great deal uh, and uh, there is so much uh, promise uh, as far as the r and d and innovation activity is concerned uh, in this area of research even the new education policy has identified uh, some focus areas which which are uh, you know quite critically kind of uh, uh, you know the electronic devices uh, are going to be uh, invented or uh, uh, these electronic devices are going to be uh, discovered the field of uh, ar vr ai and robotics and healthcare energy storage uh, and all all such areas they would all require uh, better uh, electronic devices more pre precision electronic devices faster electronic devices faster response time electronic devices and uh, uh, one of the things which the national education policy uh, is, is focusing on is the interdisciplinary research and this is where uh, uh, you know i was going to i was going through the uh, schedule of your uh, this webinar and then the the kind of uh, topics which are being covered or going to be covered in this webinar are quite uh, you know of interdisciplinary nature so this uh, i'm sure the young students and uh, some of the uh, new entrants you know in the in the field of r and d in the electronic devices they will be hugely benefited uh, by the exposure during the one day uh, webinar and uh, uh, and i just would like to also mention that uh, in the nep they also talk about uh, problem solving this is you know who are in this area of research, uh, i'm sure you have at the back of your mind you have this imperative for the country that you know whatever we do whatever devices we come up with whatever innovations we do that would have some uh, application to address a particular uh, issue or a problem which the which the country is facing so with these words and uh, uh, hoping that this one day webinar would be uh, quite uh, engaging and quite fruitful to all of you. Uh, I wish you the very best uh, and thank you, Dr. Ratul, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you and all the best. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, nothing can be a better introduction uh, for this webinar. Uh, you talk uh, uh, many things about micro and nanoelectronic things and uh, it's a very nice introduction thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, some time from your busy schedule thank you so much uh, may i now request uh, dean school of engineering professor sk sina sir uh, to say a few words and i also request him to uh, share this session morning session thank you <coughs> All today's uh, thank you, Pr Honorable Vice Chancellor of my university, Tejpur University, and Professor uh, Samar Saha uh, from Santa Clara University, USA, the organizers of this uh, seminar. Okay, well, webinar, webinar, one day webinar, uh, uh, Professor Ratul. Barwa and uh, Dr. Gushami and all others, Professor uh, P.P. Shahu, HOD of EC, and the other faculty members who are present online today. I welcome also all the participants of this webinar. I, I'm told that this webinar has around 600 registered 17 countries 
I welcome you all to this event. This event on one day webinar on micro and nano electronic devices and sensors 2020-21. The objectives of this webinar are to familiarize students, scholars, and faculty on latest reports and advancements in micro and nano electronic devices and sensors, and to host a platform for interacting with prominent researchers in this country. Actually, this event is hosted by uh, the, the Electronics and Communication Engineering Department, which was established in 1997. And currently, uh, this uh, department is like master degree PG programs, like AMTEC in programs in electronic design and technology, and uh, AMTEC in bioelectronics, and also undergraduate programs like BTEC. And also we have PhD programs. This is for all the participants, students from across 17 countries. So I welcome you all to this School of Engineering as a Dean School of Engineering, also to this Department of Electronic And you know well that uh, this is the age, 21st century, is the age of smart devices, smart cities, smart cars, and the smartness of these devices, the smartness is actually implemented or it is the result, outcome of the devices uh, like sensors and also nano and micro devices, this. So entire gamut of this modern day civilization, particularly this 21st century beginning, this is basically a smart device, smart cities and our smart life. So this is possible because of these tiny devices called the sensors and also micro devices. I welcome you all to this uh, also uh, as a chairperson of session chair of the first session, formal, uh, forenoon session. I welcome to this session and this session is very interesting session because two eminent speakers are there um, and they will be talking on different topics which are very relevant to the latest developments in uh, micro and nano devices and the first talk is by Professor Samar Saha and Professor Samar Saha has served as the 2016-17 president of the IEEE Electron Devices Society and currently serving EDS as the senior past president and chairperson of the JJ Evers Award and Fellow Evaluations Committee. He is the chief research scientist as uh, Prospitian Devices, California, USA, at and an adjunct in the Electrical Engineering Department, Santa Clara University, California, USA. In the past, he has worked in various technical and management positions at National Semiconductor, LSI Logs, Philips Semiconductors, Silicon Storage Technology, Synopsys, DSM Solutions, and Sue Walter. In academia, he has worked as a faculty member in the electrical engineering departments at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, Auburn University, the University of Nevada, Las, Las Vegas, and the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Dr. Saha has authored over 100 research papers, two books entitled Fin FET Devices for VLSI Circuits and Systems, CRC Press, USA 2020. It was published by CRC Press and Compact Models for Integrated Circuit Design, Conventional Transistors and Beyond, which is also published by CRC Press, USA in 2015. One book chapter on technology computer-aided design and holds 12 U.S. patents. His research interests include nanoscale device and process architecture, TCAD, compact modeling devices for renewable energy, and TCAD and R&D management. He received his PhD degree in physics from Gowati University, Assam, and MS degree in engineering management from Stanford University, USA. He is an IEEE fellow and a fellow of 
IET Technology UK. And we are happy to know that Professor Saha is the son of Assam. That means he is from Assam, originally from Assam, and is the alumnus uh, of Gowadi University, the university you have from IL Superstar. Uh, we welcome Professor Saha and uh, the today's talk by Professor Samar Saha is on planar CMOS device technology for advanced BLSS circuits and systems. Welcome, Professor Saha. Welcome to this webinar and welcome to this particular session. Thank you. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Thank you, Professor Shinda, for introduction. And thanks to Professor uh, Borowa for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Talk about Planar CMOS device technology for advanced LSS circuits and systems. The outline of my presentation includes overview of metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, that's MOSFETs, for integrated circuit manufacturing, challenges of MOSFETs, and planar complementary MOS, that is CMOS technology for manufacturing advanced ICs. And not, uh, then I'll talk about non-planar CMOS device technology and its challenges for manufacturing advanced ICs at the nanometer nodes, and advanced planar CMOS technologies for manufacturing ICs. In this, I will I talk about device architecture and uh, summary. So in overview of metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, we we'll talk about uh, device MOS, uh, MOSFET uh, devices. That MOSFET devices have been the mainstream device technology for integrated circuit manufacturing and growth of semiconductor industry for over last 40 years. So MOSFET is characterized by channel W, then channel length L, and oxide, uh, gate oxide thickness T ox, and source and drain on either side of this gate. So there are three modes of oper operation of MOSFET devices, accumulation, when the same type of substrate, uh, same type of uh, uh, concentration is accumulated near the silicon silicon dioxide interface. That's accumulation of same type of uh, charge in, in, near the surface. The depletion that is ch uh, uh, charge of the interface, and then inversion. That means all the if it is started with the p-type body, we we invert the surface and create a op create opposite type of carrier concentration. So basic device operation of MOSFETs, source strain structures, source strain, uh, uh, source strain contacts are reverse biased so that we don't have any current through the uh, uh, to, uh, current from source to drain when gate voltage is equal to zero or drain voltage is equal to zero. So gate voltage controls the surface carrier densities and device operation. A certain value of gate voltage which we De, uh, which we define as threshold voltage is required to create an inversion layer. So for VG less than, gate voltage less than this critical threshold voltage to invert the channel, we have only two back-to-back -back diodes and only leakage current flow, that is drain current is almost zero. And for gate voltage greater than this threshold voltage, that on voltage, an inversion layer exists from source to drain, a conductive channel so that uh, uh, IDS will flow, and thus IDS is function of gate voltage, body bias, VB, and then source voltage, VS, and drain voltage, VD. Typically, source is the uh, reference, uh, reference point, so that is, uh, we can write IDS is function of VGS, 
PBS and BDS. Source is the uh, reference uh, reference point. So that is, uh, we can write IDS is function of VGS, PBS, and BDS. So MOSFET, to improve the performance of MOSFET devices, this MOSFET has been, in last 40, evaluation of MOSFET stru structures has been evolved over the years. So MOSFET structure has continuously evolved to pursue device miniaturization, that means scaling down the device uh, geometry and improve device performance at lower cost. So that is nothing but the Moore's law. So in 1970s to 80s, this was, this is a uh, uh, only difference is the locus isolation. Locus isolation was a, uh, basically a, a bottleneck to the devices because this locus isolation, uh, uh, about 10,000 angstrom, oxide thickness, it, it took about 20, uh, 12 hours to grow this oxide thickness. And in addition to that, uh, when it is growing, there is oxide also underneath the source drain, uh, underneath the gate oxide. So as a result, it takes a lot of areas. So then to overcome this, uh, that uh, problem, so it started in 1990s, shallow trans isolation. So there's oxide on both sides. So the, instead of uh, this uh, th this uh, shallow trans isolation, it saves time as well as just deposit oxide to isolate the devices from one device to the another. Then to further continue this uh, device scaling or miniaturization, so what happened is old structure, what, when source trains, uh, when devices are shrunk, then source train comes close to each other. As a result, these pain junkies uh, uh, PN junction depletion region because the source is uh, opposite type uh, channel. So this uh, 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 depletion region merge, source and drain depletion region merge at the center. So creating points through between source to drain and that increases the leakage current. So to further, uh, uh, to further facilitate the shrinking of the device or scaling down of the device, this channel type doping, which is called halo doping or pocket doping is implemented. So that this uh, highly uh, a high doping concentration is localized around the source drain, so that depletion region is cannot move further into the uh, uh, channel region. So in that way, we can shrink the device further. Along with the body uh, changing to facilitate further scaling. So next, we we'll talk about challenges of this planar MOSFET devices. So. Devices um, short channel effect is the main problem of these uh, older or the planar MOSFET devices until the about uh, 30 nanometer technology that you can go. So MOSFET's scaling challenges is, as you can see from this beam grab, this plot, uh, IV plot, what we can see that uh, as we decrease the channel length, this uh, current increases. That means leakage current, which is defined at gate voltage is equal to zero. So leakage current increases as we decrease the channel length. So that is leakage current uh, is function of channel length. So does threshold voltage. So threshold voltage is also channel length dependence. Then slope of this curve is also channel length dependence. And uh, uh, so I of slope of the curve and threshold voltage, they are channel length dependent. And at the same time, they are degrading. So degradation of all these parameters as we decrease the channel length. So thus we can see that conventional MOSFETs cannot meet the VLSI circuit design requirements for advanced VLSI circuit design requirements, which requires low uh, threshold voltage, low offset leakage current, and low sub-threshold slope, that is faster turn on, and at the same time, low variability of so, uh, sub-threshold slope as well as threshold voltage. So, and then another issue with uh, scaling devices is the uh, variability. So variation cannot be controlled as we shrink the devices, scale the devices. So here it shows the uh, on current for PMOS on the vertical axis and NMOS on the horizontal axis. As you can see that both uh, there are lots of variation but that's a distribution of this ion and IP on current for both NMOS and PMOS is all over the place. And this variability, whether 
or where our uh, target device is at the center, which is uh, red dots, which is the nominal data. So this is the target design target or process target to achieve this. But at the same time, if we measure uh, hundreds or hundreds of devices, we see that this distribution is all over the place for the identical devices. As we see, uh, so uh, for this, for this, so variability is out of control that we cannot. So this is the problem with uh, 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 conventional devices. So then evolution continues. Then started the non-planar technology. So to overcome the scaling challenges of the conventional device, we can use ultra thin body devices. So ultra thin body that is uh, main thing is gate has more control. As we in conventional devices, as we move away from the gate, that means deep subsurface, gate loses its control. So as a result, we have drain to source leakage, as it is shown. So now, if we decrease the uh, channel, uh, if we decrease the thickness of this uh, body ch uh, channel, then uh, we can cut off. And at the same time, we use uh, oxide, that means buried oxide. So silicon on SY substrate, silicon on insulator substrate. So this is silicon where we have the channel source and drain. So leakage path that is from source to drain or drain to source is cut off in the, in, uh, in the oxide. And in this way, so if we further decrease the thickness of the silicon, then we can manage leakage path. And at the same time, we use the undoped body to reduce the variability. So that's what uh, uh, to overcome the challenges imposed by conventional devices. So evaluation continues, evaluation of device structure on the thin body MOSFETs. So number one, that's on the left -hand, top left-hand side, you can see that is ultra thin body single gate MOSFETs. So this is exactly ultra thin body, T silicon thickness, and all over by oxide and SY substrate and one gate. But we can further eliminate the leakage path because as we know that uh, 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 gate controls near the surface, and as we move air face, gate controls, gate loses control and creates, uh, and as a result, we get, get the uh, leakage path. So if we have double gates, that means one gate at the top, so uh, that controls the top surface, and, uh, the, uh, and the, the leakage path that is far away from the top gate can be controlled by the bottom gate, and vice versa. So we control the top surface, and, uh, the, uh, and the, the leakage path that is far away from the top gate can be controlled by the bottom gate and vice versa. So in that way, we can, uh, we can reduce the uh, leakage current a, a lot by using the whole gate vertical. So that gives you, the channel is vertical now. So, and we have a gate that the oxide on both sides, gate on both sides. So that actually constitutes a vertical device which is uh, basically the fin fed. So fin fed is a double gate MOSFET, which is vertically standing on the silicon substrate or, or any uh, silicon insulator substrate. So this can be MOSFET on bulk silicon substrate or fin fed on, uh, on, on my SY substrate. So this is on the left-hand side of this slide shows the fin fed or double gate MOSFETs on, uh, on SY substrate. So this is actually SY uh, silicon on insulator, on insulator substrate, which is makes the fin. And on the right hand side of the, of the uh, right hand side the structure shows the fin fed device or double gate device on silicon directly on silicon substrate for which have the uh, 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 isolation. So this is oxide isolation for uh, bulk silicon substrate. If we use uh, silicon on insulator substrate, we don't have this oxide, buried oxide itself serves as the uh, uh, isolation uh, isolation there. So the previous slide, this was actually double gate. So we can use this as triple gate also. On the triple gate is then we use the gate uh, on the top of same gate oxide thickness on the top, and then we have a metal on the uh, on the top of this uh, oxide, so that constitutes a triple gate structure. So triple gate structure also we have on SY substrate, and also on the right hand side we have a uh, uh, right structure. We have uh, these uh, uh, bulk silicon substrate. Ultra thin body, what it is also characterized by gate length. 
this is the ga gate length then uh, fin height which is which defines the de uh, width of the device and fin thickness or uh, or silicon thickness which is t fin and then gate oxide thickness which is uh, this on the on the on the two side walls of this vertical uh, silicon uh, vertical silicon body and then uh, silicon substrate mostly it is undoped or lightly doped and then source source and drain so source and drain is uh, the front one front uh, fin is the source and the back fin uh, uh, back of this uh, gate is the drain and fin fed like a uh, conventional mosfet is also has three modes of operation accumulation depletion and inversion so performance of this ultra thin body so it as you well know that we eliminate a short channel effect threshold voltage vth is less sensitive to l because of uh, uh, improved gate control by using two gates then threshold voltage is less is less sensitive to vdd because we can use now lower uh, drain voltage also that is immune to debull drain induced barrier lowering and as is so we can uh, turn on the device faster because of gate control is uh, higher. So as a result, S is less sensitive to L and PDT. So we can scale the devices as uh, as uh, physics permits. An undoped or lightly doped channel offers less variability due to random discrete doping and less surface scattering than less. Uh, so as a result, less mobility degra degradation. So, and uh, lower operating uh, voltage, as I mentioned before, that we can uh, uh, use much lower uh, uh, voltage because of uh, double gate. And as a result, we have lower power consumption and we can do continuous, uh, uh, continuous setting of the de devices, probably around the uh, three nanometer regime. Uh, uh, Professor Saha. Yes. Yeah, uh, can you uh, uh, hide the uh, uh, sharing a small screen, or maybe you put it in the you know this bottom? Uh, a small one, small screen that stops sharing is written right. That small screen you can put it uh, in the bottom line probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, or probably you can hide it. I, I didn't follow. So what do you want to? Yeah, yeah that uh, stop sharing something is written, right? That small screen uh, just above your main screen. Drag, drag. Uh -huh. drag. Or, or drag, drag the, yeah, yeah, this one, this one, right, yeah. Just drag below this small screen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe below. Yeah, yeah, this is good. This one is blocking me too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is fine, yeah. Okay. Okay, is it okay now? Uh, let me see if I can move. Yeah, maybe you can put just below the bar. Yeah, we can. Yeah, this is that? fine. This is good. Okay. This is good. Okay, these are the advantages of uh, so continuous device miniaturization near three nanometer regime. So, with uh, all those uh, of, uh, advantages, over the bulk pin, uh, over the conventional pin feds. So, uh, pin feds is transitioning to mainstream IC technology that was in year 2011. So, MOSFETs, conventional MOSFETs to pin feds that were uh, Intel in 2011 adopted pin feds for sub 20 nanometer node microprocessor technologies. So, later, more semiconductor manufacturers like TSMC, Samsung, and global foundries also adopted. Uh, Follow Intel's path. The major challenges of FinFET fabrication technology. So FinFET fabrication technology, as we as I will show, that is very complex. You can see the three D structure. So uh, to understand the complexity of uh, FinFET devices, I will be briefly describe the process modules so uh, starting starting materials so bulk silicon i'll talk about bulk silicon actually the uh, sy silicon is not sy the fin fat is not that much complex but it has uh, its, its own problem also 
then uh, starting with the uh, silicon wafer so then we give, form the oil formation actually oil can be formed before or after the fin for fin patterning also then we do fin patterning that fin formation then polysilicon tamagate formation then after that we do source stain so polygate uh, this polysilicon tamagate is used to do all the processing source stain processing source stain extension source stain uh, raised source stain and after that we replace this polygate by uh, metal gate so metal gate and high gate dielectric processing so these are the two actually complex uh, complex processing fin patterning and replacement metal gate so then self self aligned contact formation and back end of the line so major challenges that uh, includes fabrication technology challenges so on the right hand side i showed the uh, up to the fin formation silicon fins and this is actually uh, it is complement it is a cmos device on the uh, this uh, green actually shows pol and then blue shows the n well uh, and all the fins that will be used for uh, making the uh, gate and the devices so precise fin patterning you can see this this narrow fins it is very hard to control this precisely this fin patterning then edge control edge control i'll talk about that edge control is that uh, without any s stop layer it is hard to control this s process it has to be controlled by timing and the edge rate then uh, gate and spacer patterning so that is also similar problem and then conformal and uniform uniform doping uh, problem comes because there are vertical structures this is a vertical structure and then we form another so we have uh, orthogonal that means uh, 90 degree uh, two vertical structures 90 degree to each other so as a result what happens is doping conformal doping is an issue then uh, high gate dielectric and replacement metal gate formation i'll show that so this is the process level complexities and challenges and device technology challenges that includes multiple uh, vth manufacturing technology that means so this is a uh, hard to make multiple threshold voltage in normally in any device technology you have low uh, low vt you have high vt you have medium vt and all sorts of three or four types of flavors of vt is used in one device technology so it is in principle it is hard but it is can be achieved then with quantization so we cannot use in uh, uh, in analog devices we can use uh, normally we use uh, different width starting from suppose uh, 30 uh, 30 uh, angstrom 30 nanometer to 50 or 100 nanometer so that is uh, that is the challenge for pin fed devices and then crystal orientation and then also parasitic elements that may source and series resistance because fins are so thin so how can you make a very uh, low uh, low source and series resistance so to start with that after after the oil formation so the or before the oil formation whenever we are doing fin patterning so first we deposit different layers so first is pad oxide so all these oxides are a square which can be stopped so this is why which is a uh, silicon dioxide or this is a uh, called sacrificial oxide then silicon nitride layer then after that amorphous uh, carbon layer this is also called uh, mandrel and then on the top is uh, 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 bottom anti-reflection coating so this is another layer bottom anti-reflection coating so that does that etching differentially can be stopped at these layers then we do uh, lithography masking and lithography so we we'll get photography of it and then we do the etching so that etching that uh, it assess up to silicon or uh, it is uh, 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 selective uh, selective etching so it stops at the silicon nitride and then we have this pattern and then we remove the uh, remove the photoresist and we get uh, this carbon patterning and then after that next step we do oxide spacer deposition this oxide special deposition and then do oxide etch and then this is the car come that is carbon mineral etching so the carbon that was helping to uh, make these oxide spacers so we remove that then we have oxide spacer this uh, uh, pattern oxide uh, spacers patterning and then after that we remove the silicon nitride so this is that we have this this pattern and silicon nitride as i said all these layers are uh, used as edge 
stopper, so we can stop selectively H and on the bad oxide. And then, then this is the uh, coming uh, the trouble for, that we are having now, trans H. So where to stop this trans H? So this is a challenge that is, uh, we don't have a S stopping layer here. So we have to precisely control the etching rate and at the uh, end time so that we can exactly uh, stop just below, before the uh, P plus silicon substrate. And this is this was uh, this uh, line that it shows that is our uh, epitaxial, undoped epitaxial layer that was the original, uh, original uh, starting materials. Then on the top, then we do liner oxide growth. So liner oxide is just to move, uh, remove the edges, uh, rough edges of uh, this uh, uh, etching, and then uh, trench fill, and then do planarization, and then after that we remove the nitride and just as it will keep it smaller. So here comes the, then we do remove, then we do STI formation. So STI formation, so again, this is the precise issues that uh, uh, this is self aligned double patterning. That is first time we do pattern that was uh, uh, oxide spacers. The second time we do, uh, this is uh, self aligned uh, patterning to expose the, expose the uh, silicon fin. So this is called SADP process. And so this is uh, uh, now, this is, as I mentioned before, this is uh, where to stop because this defines, this STI process defines the fin height. Fin height, as well, which is uh, uh, actually fin height, which uh, twice the fin height is the width of the device. So this STI process without any uh, S-stopper is uh, very precisely needs to be controlled so that uh, we can have the fin regular uh, precise fin height. So challenges of fin formation for bulk fin fats, precise and uniform fin patterning by timing process, no S stop layer. So fin height controlled by STI thickness. So STI thickness controls the fin height and fins at the edges suffers higher variability. So because at the edge, there is a, there could be more, uh, the edge rate could be high. So depending on edge rate and the uh, edges that fin, uh, fins uh, uh, variability could be very high. So these are the uh, issues of pin patterning. Then next issue is uh, after that we do uh, after this pin patterning we do uh, poly uh, would be uh, poly gate uh, poly, uh, poly gate and then process source drain uh, processing. After source drain processing, then we come to this uh, uh, this amorphous. We we uh, do all the processing and then after sodium processing we deposit this uh, phosphosilicate glass on the top and then do planarize using chemical mechanical polishing and then so we get this structure after sodium processing. Then next we etch the gate a poly gate. So dummy gate removal we can see from the top of the top of, from the top this shows the top view. So this is the cavity after removing this dummy gate. Okay. So challenges is sidewall poly, poly residual removal. So when you receive, remove this poly, there are it, it is not shown here. So there are poly residues that has to be precisely removed by edge control. So that is a real issue. So that is a, 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 so metal gate formation and dummy, dummy gate uh, removal and metal gate formation is real issue. Then after that, uh, we have to remove this uh, uh, ESL oxide layer from the, uh, and then deposit the, uh, so this exposed fin, and after exposed fin, we deposit uh, uh, silicon dioxide, and then after that, uh, high gate and metal gate processing. So these are, uh, these are the, some of the issues. And actually also there are uh, precise, uh, I did not uh, show here, that the uh, precise uh, 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 implantation and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, doping control, doping uh, control because of the particle structure. And then device level challenges, that includes the threshold voltage, multi-threshold technology, multi or multiple uh, threshold voltage technology. So in CMOS, we can do easily because threshold voltage is defined by this equation. That is threshold voltage is function of oxide thickness and body uh, body concentration. So, but in uh, thin film, uh, sorry, in thin fats, we don't have, 
N B because uh, body is very likely doped, so we cannot increase the body doping, or we cannot have multiple uh, body doping because we cannot control the doping concentration anyway because of vertical structure. Then, uh, uh, so multiple VTAs is an issue. However, we can visit the uh, we can get an analog uh, analogous equation, similar equation like bulk MOSFET of threshold voltage expression. So we can see that this uh, flat band voltage includes. Uh, in course gave uh, 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 phi m and phi s which is uh, what function difference between poly uh, power metal gate and semiconductor uh, which is fin body fin uh, body uh, silicon surface or silicon body of the fins so this uh, what function difference or particularly what function of this metal can be monitored or can be changed to change the threshold uh, change the threshold voltage so uh, change CoX using multiple oxide thickness is difficult, cannot be done. So multiple fin, which is a possibility that we use different fin thickness or different fin height, that is also uh, need different special technologies. So that is also hard to do. But easiest way to do is using uh, the work function engineering. So work function engineering that phi m, and that uh, is actually done by to. Uh, there is a best option and that is used in uh, FinFET technology so that by introducing nitrogen implantation. So more the nitrogen uh, content, then more you can get a different uh, threshold voltage. The next is, uh, so width quantization. Width quantization is because fin height is design, uh, defined by SGI thickness, so only we can get only uniform fin thickness. That is only one. Uh, only we can get a fin height of, uh, of of uniform fin height or uh, under uh, different variation. So we can get one only one fin height. We cannot have half a fin height for one device and two two times fin height of another device. So we cannot do that. So we have to have a fin. This is a discrete number. So that is H fin is due to two sidewall gates. And then uh, so here actually W is n times Two uh, n is number of fins times uh, the uh, twice the uh, fin height for two gate uh, uh, double or two gates on both sides of the fin, and the, if it is a triple gate, then oh, we have gate on the top also, so they use the plus t fin. So here actually uh, we have it has to be n times of this com combination. So uh, w values depend on the number n required to achieve the target drive current of the device. So we use, for this for this uh, CMOS device, there are three fins, there are three pins I use for PMOS and three pins for NMOS. So uh, sometimes you may need uh, for uh, higher current, you may have uh, four or five or multiple fins. So W is, thus W is quantized, only a discrete number of fins can be used or allowed to define the W. So that is, that comes the analog design challenges. W is design parameter, and W is continuous variable, not discrete. So then another challenge is crystal orientation, because as you can see on the uh, this wafer uh, on the left hand side, that is if we orient the device perpendicular to this uh, uh, perpendicular to this wafer flat at one one zero direction and parallel to the wafer flat, that is also 110 direction. And then mobility depends on how we orient the device on silicon uh, silicon wafer. So if it is 110 direction, 110 direction, NMOS mobility is low, lowest, and PMOS mobility is highest. And, on other, uh, or, and if you use 100 direction, where NMOS or electron mobility is high and whole mobility is low, so, but in fin fed, since this is a vertical device on silicon, silicon, so this device is oriented in multiple direction anyway because of this vertical. So that comes the challenges for the layout design. So how we how we layout that uh, layout the devices to maximize the mobility and device performance. So that is a challenge. So electromobility for in fin pads and whole mobility. So we have to trade. There is a trade off how we can. Uh, uh, orient this uh, uh, layout, how, when you make the layout, how you orient these devices on the silicon. 
So another challenge is parasitic effects. Parasitic effects that is uh, since fins are very narrow, so what happens is oh, uh, resistance is very high. So for that we use raised source chain. So raised source chain is fine, but to reduce further the uh, source chain uh, source series resistance to reduce further, we merge these source chains. So merge this source chain, this merged source chain because these are grown by selective epitaxy, selective epitaxial growth. So this merged source chain is causes sometimes problem, particularly when it is uh, uh, it's SY, thin uh, plate on SY substrate. In fact, on SY substrate, that is very hard to control because where it is merged and there is a narrow point, narrow uh, between between two uh, raised source chain. So that is also generally uh, generally an issue of uh, fin fed devices. So then we move to planar CMOS technologies. So uh, which uh, so uh, so we see that fin fed devices are complex and has issues but at the same time all these issues are solved but the complexity still remains so we can further go back actually where historically in semiconductor or particularly micro microelectronics industry this it was always a uh, uh, always innovation in technological innovation or device structure innovation so what you can do is we can use the same devices all the things that we need to control leakage current and variability so variability for that we need low uh, or undoped channel and to control leakage current we need to stop uh, increase gate control or we can somehow we have to stop this uh, penetration of this uh, source drain uh, depletion region at the center to merge so that they don't merge at the center so that there we can do another way by using uh, undoped body so here we use buried halo mosfet device so we use the halo device, multiple halos, and after that, after multiple halos, first of all, using multiple halo, I will talk about that. So uh, undoped or lightly doped channel is formed by up diffusion of halo profiles into undoped epitaxial layer grown on silicon substrate. So first we deposit, first we implant all the oil implantation, then the uh, uh, voltage implantation, then all the multiple halo implantation, and then after all this implantation using a dummy gate, we can uh, uh, then we clean the surface and then grow the epitaxial layer. So epitaxial layer will up diffuse all the doping concentration, but near the surface it will be still undoped. So this basic uh, architecture of multi halo MOSFETs. Multiple halo, halo MOSFET as is shown in this uh, uh, structure, that heavily doped first halo, halo one, is around the source drain extension that is a shallow source drain extension is halo one and then deep halo is after that deep halo is formed with a, a spacer deep halo is formed around the source drain deep source drain so this source drain so and then uh, you do a thermal cycle then these two halos generally merge but at the same time these halos are localized in that way we can keep the localized halo to reduce the pass through between source and drain. This uh, shows the process. Process. So first is gate definition, then shallow halo implant, sh uh, shallow halo uh, implantation. Then after that, use a uh, offset spacer to uh, implant implant uh, uh, source and extension, and then uh, 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 and the deep halo implant, and then. Uh, and then after that, we do deep source drain, we do spacer, and then deep source drain implant, and then after that, open activation. So this is the normally on silicon substrate. So we use the this same process on uh, for this uh, buried halo. So all the process that was done before, this process after doing this process, what we do is we uh, deposit we uh, do a potential silicon layer on the top of it. So we're doing a similar structure. So this dotted line, so source drain are shown on both sides. This is the pattern, so the, not much, only numbers are showing. So this dotted line, that shows the, this is PMOS, uh, N NMOS device on the left-hand side, PMOS device on the right-hand side. So dotted one is uh, halo one, and the solid line is halo two, after the uh, uh, epitaxial layer formation, epitaxial layer is shown by this two or two, so this epitaxial layer. And then, so in that way, we get, uh, 
we get the undocked, uh, undocked surface and then halo that is uh, uh, protecting the source strain to, uh, to reduce the current. So this is actually shown in color. That's what we do. Starting silicon wafer is doped with oil implants, formation of N and P oil. And then optional tissue bottles implant if it is necessary. So here it is showing tissue bottles implant, this one, and the tissue bottles implant on this uh, uh, PMOS uh, side of the device. And then after multiple halo implants, that is halo, halo, and then deep halo using spacers. And then, uh, uh, so after then we clean the substrate, we use a dummy gate here. Uh, and then the epitaxial layer. So then that actually, uh, uh, that actually up diffuses all the halo layers. First, this uh, dotted line is a uh, shallow halo, that is halo one, and the deep, uh, solid line is halo two. So for both NMOS and PMOS devices. So finally, so then, then after that, we do isolation and then gate engineering, replacement uh, gate engineering, and then source drain engineering, and then back end of the line process. So then, so this is shows the complete structure all the halos, individual halos are shown here. So this is uh, the complementary uh, buried halo MOSFETs. And performance of buried halo MOSFETs, if we look at the performance, so this is actually leakage current is uh, 10 nanoam per micron we can uh, uh, show uh, without uh, much, uh, uh, we, can, we can further reduce, but uh, uh, why this, uh, technology that we can do around uh, 40, 40 nanometer gate length, uh, effective gate length. So we have, we have about 10 nanogram per micron uh, of straight leakage current. And then uh, in PMOS leakage current, PMOS uh, on current is very uh, very high. Normally, our uh, conventional CMOS, CMOS, uh, CMOS technology, PMOS current, if we get 300 microamp per micron, we are very happy. And uh, so here we are getting more. Uh, we are getting more than that. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, uh, so it is about uh, close to 350 or 360. And NMOS is uh, very uh, very high. Normally, uh, conventional uh, MOSFET PMOS we get about uh, our target is about 600 to 650. But here we are getting close to 900 uh, mic uh, mi nine, uh, microam per micron. So this is a, a very uh, good performance, comparable or. Uh, comparable to FinFET, near, near FinFET uh, performance with one single device. And then, then uh, what is about variability? <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, buried hole uh, MOSFET variability. So to uh, understand the variability, so what we have, uh, we have uh, two types of uh, variations. That is one is random. So random, uh, random variation that actually causes Mitch mass and that is problem with uh, 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 that is uh, that is actually uh, in uh, uh, so that is uh, well, that causes problem. So then we have another type of variability which is systematic or global variability, global variation. So random variation is if we have a two identical device close by, as is shown on the right hand side, the structure, source drain, and then the two gates. They are very close in a, in a uh, on a chip. So the what you can see that. Uh, the same identical structure, identically layout. So if we measure a parameter, that parameter differs. So if we measure thousands of parameters, hundreds of parameters of uh, these two identical devices, we get the variation uh, uh, of their difference. So and if we take the uh, standard deviation of that variation, that gives the uh, variance of that uh, of two identical devices. So that is actually, we define a sigma of delta P uh, it could be delta P, could be initial voltage, or could be on current. And on the other hand, systematic variation, that is the variation from uh, wafer to wafer or from lot to lot. So that is the mean variation of the mean of the of a parameter. So that is simply, we can take the standard deviation of the devices and, can, uh, and we can uh, 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 characterize that in modeling. So this random variation, is characterized by the slope of this uh, sigma delta VTH, sigma delta parameter. That means difference of uh, difference of a parameter measured for, for for different identical devices. So if we plot that along the vertical axis uh, with one of our area of that transistors, 
then we get this curve. I, ideally, this should be going through the uh, origin of this uh, IV, or origin of the plot. And then what you see that this slope of this plot that is that defines the random variation or mismatch between two identical devices. So that's how we, uh, uh, we characterize this random variation. So for very low, very low MOSFET devices, if we compare this variable, this uh, ABT parameter, that uh, slope, we can see that very low MOSFET, which is uh, shown by green lines on this uh, view graph, that is much lower than, in fact, it's almost half the uh, conventional MOSFET. So this uh, that shows that its variation is very low, variability, random random variation is low. And then if we look at the threshold voltage variability, threshold voltage variance, and red uh, defines the red actually uh, indicates the standard or conventional MOSFETs, and replace uh, represents the very narrow MOSFETs, that is new planar technology. Here we can see an open open uh, uh, symbols that indicates this uh, 20 nanometer, 20, 20 nanometer width, and the uh, and the uh, solid symbols that shows the uh, 200 nanometer, 20 nanometer width. So as we decrease the channel or uh, channel length, we see that uh, threshold voltage variation increases, and particularly for standard CMOS devices, standard uh, CMOS devices, we, we see the variation is comp uh, is about uh, more than as about eighty uh, about eighty or eighty five uh, uh, millivolt. So normally threshold voltage we expect for these devices are around 0.3 volts. And if we can eighty millivolt plus minus eighty millivolts variation, then we cannot shrink the device to twenty nanometer region. On the other hand, if we take this very little device. We can uh, up to even by five nanometer or ten nanometer devices. We get, get variation is about uh, just a little over thirty, uh, thirty, uh, thirty uh, millivolt. So in this way, we see that, uh, and if it is a two hundred nanometer device, then uh, and uh, width is about ten, then we can get uh, about ten millivolt variation of variance of uh, threshold voltage. So that's how we see that. Uh, this very low device offers very low variability as well as uh, descent to lower current or leakage current and uh, descent to uh, high uh, on current. And then, if we the MOSFET that is without the uh, uh, without the uh, uh, without the epitaxy, without the epitaxy, that means buried halo and double halo, where we have not used epitaxial layer on the top of it. So we can see, compare that. That is, double halo is also shows a better uh, architecture. Actually, in fact, double halo was uh, uh, done. Uh, uh, that patent was uh, issued in the year 2002, and that technology is used by Philips Semiconductor uh, for their. That started using that uh, for 12 nanometer. Uh, so it was uh, uh, 100 and that when I was working for Philips Semiconductor. So that was a uh, double halo MOSFET. So this is the improvement of a double halo MOSFET that is we are using epitaxial layer to update uh, uh, all these uh, um, uh, 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 halo doping, diffuse the halo doping to form the undoped uh, channel. So that actually improves the device performance of the previous devices. And then, so uh, similarly, the buried halo device shows the better performance that is green, uh, is buried halo, and uh, blue is the uh, older double halo MOSFETs. And uh, so, so green, that's double halo MOSFETs, shows the better performance in variability also. And then, uh, if we plot all three of them together, obviously, it shows that uh, red, which is conventional MOSFET, then blue, that is double halo MOSFET. So these are all in production. That is, uh, it was uh, Philips Semiconductor. Uh, and this is uh, conventional that is used to, uh, everywhere. And then uh, this is the very halo MOSFET, at the top, green at the bottom. And then if we plot all of them together, so same trend, that red is uh, uh, showing very halo MOSFET, showing better performance than all of the other devices. And then we can further, as we see that uh, as we have shown in the IV characteristics, 
that uh, device current is still the uh, we cannot compete with device current cannot compete with the uh, fin pets in fact device current uh, on current is very high so because there is a double gate so this device can also be used as double gate so if we use sy substrate we can use s and this sy substrate we can use this buried uh, uh, we can use this oxide thickness buried oxide thickness low lower enough so that we can use this uh, bottom we can use this substrate as bottom gate to modulate the uh, performance of the device so in that we can reduce the leakage current by uh, standby current standby current we can uh, use a constant bias to reduce the standby current by using a back bias and at the same time we can use the performance by using the uh, this body bias and reducing the oxide thickness so this can this has the option to use as double gate mosfet also so this is a patented uh, double gate mosfet device double gate buried yellow mosfet and so the major benefits of buried mosfet is it's a planar seamless device structure with deep with a device performance comparable to if we use double gate at least low leakage and low process variability comparable to fin fats because fin fats also has complexities and doping uh, uh, concentration there is variability also because of uh, fin fat in my book actually i uh, i uh, derived an expression for how this fin fat variation uh, fin fats process variation so and it is ideal for analog rf technology because we can have a different weight because it is a conventional device technology and low power that is green technology we can use uh, as low as may not be as low as in fed but 0.6 micron to sorry 0.6 volt or 0.7 volts can be easily used for well, vdd and existing existing cmos fabrication facility and processes can be used process modules can be used for cost effective and efficient fabrication technology and integrated circuit manufacturing at the nanometer nodes and it eliminates the complexities and challenges of fin fats so in summary mosfet device structure has been continuously evolved as we have shown to overcome the limitations of device miniaturization as we face a, a complex as we face any challenges immediately either the either technology changed or device architecture is changed to uh, so that we can improve continuously improve the device performance then after thin fin pet devices is the mainstream device technology for manufacturing advanced nanometer node because fin pet is now the pervasive technology for uh, advanced technologies and uh, fin pet device technology however it has several process and device technology challenges that has not stopped fin pet but it has it is complex and it has challenges so then hello engineered buried mosfets as i described as i described and planar cmos technology show a great potential for manufacturing advanced ics with low leakage low process variability and low power technology manufacturable in the existing cmos fabrication line so with that i uh, uh, i don't know whether i exceed that time or it's for all time so that is a uh, presentation and thank you and uh, please stay safe and if you have any questions uh, you can ask me or you can uh, send it to professor borwa so that he can uh, send to me and then i can uh, reply uh, thank you so much sir uh, uh, this was a very enlightening talk and uh, you top sort light from devices to uh, fabrication methods uh, experience from each slide uh, i have a general question Uh, sure. Is it the end of uh, Moore's era, or how long we can reduce the channel length? Uh, because smartphones of seven uh, nanometer channel length uh, is already claimed. Uh, so, what is your comment on that? This is one. And uh, number two is uh, we have many research scholars uh, uh, from different universities. and uh, it will be great if you talk a bit uh, on which areas or topics uh, they should attack uh, something like that uh, so th these are two questions and we have few questions from uh, participants also 
I have one or two questions. Actually, Barak. Wow, but let me uh, address uh, what Professor Bolwa asked me. Yes. So first is uh, technology. So in technology, what you can do is uh, uh, recent technology. I gave a talk uh, and uh, this uh, shield chart. There was a uh, conference there. So one one technology that is uh, uh, re-emerging that is thin film transistors. So for research, uh, this is for the address to the uh, new research. So thin film transistor research is more on the, this is the display technology. And uh, the title of my talk was uh, Thin Flame Transistors for Ubiquitous, of, uh, 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 ubiquitous of, uh, uh, of, uh, of display technology and flexible electronics. Right? So that is, a, uh, that is a new area. And the flexible electronics is now uh, invading everywhere. Because your uh, silicon, that is IMS, that is a, comp uh, that is a uh, uh, in Stuttgart, there is IM chips. What they do is silicon devices. They uh, they uh, just take it and then put on flexible strips, so that you can use flexible electronics with silicon. So right. So flexible electronics is a hot and uh, thin frame transistors is a uh, hot area. So that is one of the research areas. And uh, because in uh, main device technology, what happened is these are very expensive to do research because of the fabrication, you know, that is a billion dollar fab, right? So that is very hard. But thin frame technology that is easily, uh, or transistors can be easily manufactured, easily uh, fabricated in any fab. You can set up the fab because when I did my research in Guwahati University, I did work on thin film transistors, thin film, not transistors, thin film deposition techniques, right? So that one can be converted to making a transistor. So this is what any lab, physics lab can do that. So that is a research area. And then to address the, uh, your work, how this uh, scaling will continue. So actually, I, I did not put that slide. So this is uh, uh, what, uh, what we are doing all along for the last 40, 40 years, that uh, you shrink the device and to go along the Moore's law. And then when it deviates, that is, we cannot go on the same line, then we fall on the Moore's law. Then we try to improvise. Improvise means technological change, technology change, or device architecture change. So in that way, we can get into the Moore's law, that Moore's law line, and then fall. Right. So and then oh, what uh, and presently what we are doing that is people call it uh, more than more more and uh, more than more. So that is actually we use a uh, uh, particular that is application based. Application based. Suppose it is uh, one area of application is memory. So you uh, do the technology according to that way so that it is applicable for memory. So and sometimes with uh, design uh, design changes. So you can use uh, process technology and then design. And how you accommodate that uh, to improve the performance? Use more uh, integration. That is more devices make a whole system, right? Instead of one device, now have more uh, more performance in one chip. So that's how uh, it is. And how long it'll continue? At least about probably uh, well, next 2020, 2025, or maybe 2020, 2030. So it should go in the 10 years by this uh, just a patch up way. So I have two questions. Sure. One question is uh, we are making the planar structure, but when you fabricate the planar structure, it's not exactly planar structure. Uh, it is coming some uh, parabolic structure the below because of a uh, limitation of etching. Even if we use a uh, dry etching, so we cannot exactly get the planar structure. So how it affects, how it degrades the device performance if we don't have perfect planar structure? So uh, uh, you are saying that uh, etching etch problems. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Second, yeah, second question is that uh, how this structure can be used in the uh, RF circuit design because RF circuit design because we, we have shown a lot of um, uh, oxide metal deposition metal structure uh, we have made it so there will be a lot of parasitic effects I mean especially capacitance will be uh, generated when you design how whether we have considered this parasitic effects in your design and when you while do, uh, doing the circuit design or while because this 
degrade the performance of the uh, integral circuit. This so yeah, I, yeah, please answer it. So your first question is uh, etching uh, the devices. Yes, it is not a panel panel structure. Exactly panel structure. It's giving in the below parabolic type of structure is giving because it's not exactly planar. It is not coming planar. So how it degrade the device performance? So uh, yeah, if I understood correctly, so if you have a structure, so that structure suppose uh, uh, in older days what used to do in particularly in uh, university lab, university doesn't have a high uh, uh, expensive fabrication facility. So what used to do is suppose we are doing modeling, then we uh, use a longer uh, long, uh, long device. Right, use a long device and use suppose uh, I do I, I want to make a 10 nanometer device. So I am starting with a long device and then use source pen of uh, source pen over diffuse inside the uh, uh, so diffuse further so that I ultimately I get a, a 10 nanometer device. So start with a long uh, long device and then make source pen uh, uh, source pen uh, uh, diffusion. Or higher so that uh, so it diffuses further, further, and ultimately you get a smaller device. So that is one way that uh, all these uh, modeling uh, university used to do modeling. So because they cannot do a smaller device, so they just use that tricks to uh, use the effective channel length to smaller. And then uh, you RF. I don't know whether is your question was that or not. And for RF uh, and parasitics, you need a better model. So that is, uh, modeling should be accurate, and uh, you have to extract all those two different models and then use uh, in circuit uh, input file or circuit power to uh, do the circuit simulation. Today, you have to consider parasitic. When you move the high frequency, you your uh, this capacitance, this uh, parasitic capacitance, which is only due to the mid and optical layer. Uh, Maybe there. So this uh, this uh, concern you have to take. It. So how to tackle this problem if we use this thin thin uh, the, this this? You are talking about thin pen transistors. Professor uh, Professor Shinad, uh, oh, Professor Shaho, right? So. Uh, uh, Actually, I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, once. Uh, I uh, I don't know the structure. So if I see the structure, I can probably. Uh, I can comment on it. Professor uh, Sa. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any any other question from the participants, online participants or from different countries? So yeah, uh, I get. Yeah, I have two, three questions from participants. Uh, yeah. Actually, there are many, and uh, we have around more than 80 participants online, and all of them participants. Thank Professor Saha. So, uh, one question uh, from Ms. Rohana uh, Is the lithography done at nanoscale uh, using X rays or UV? It is uh, still UV. So uh, it X-ray has not been uh, actively used in industry yet. Okay. Another question uh, from my colleague Rupam uh, is: uh, What are the advantages of halo doping, and is there any issue uh, of parasitic capacitances uh, with halo doping? Halo doping advantage is, uh, as I briefly mentioned, that it is uh, to reduce the leakage current. So this halo actually it is uh, localized near the source chain extensions, okay? source chain extensions. So that the uh, depletion region is uh, confined near, near the source chain extensions, so that uh, we don't have a punch through. And so as a result, what happened? We, I can use the whole uh, uh, after the halo whole channel as undoped channel, undoped channel. So that reduces the leakage uh, that reduces the leakage current because of halo and uh, eliminates the or reduces the variability because of under channels that is particularly visual voltage variation because of random uh, random doping and uh, well, regarding uh, capacitance yes you have a valid point actually if uh, doping concentration is too high that uh, 
very increase the market. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, another question from uh, Miss Ananda Bhattacharya. Uh, what trans fill process is used, and uh, will Mars source and drain have an implication on uh, leakage current or sorting the device at nanoscale? Uh, actually, Mars source drain. Actually, there uh, uh, Mars source drain. Uh, probably, it will not increase the leakage current because uh, there is a. Uh, um, uh, spacers because because uh, on the uh, after the spacers you have source drain right so space uh, that spacers will protect the leakage current and what are the other question other questions was yeah uh, what is the trans fill process uh, where is uh, or why is trans fill process used okay so that is uh, uh, that is for bulk uh, bulk fill pad that is the probably process available. So that's why it is uh, uh, SYS is more preferable, though it is uh, higher cost. Higher cost, but SY has also some other issues because the forming uh, uh, raised short end is also an issue for SY. So uh, by SY pin pad, if we use SY pin pad, then uh, we don't have that problem for uh, uh, the uh, trans fill. Okay. And at the SY also uh, helps uh, to define SY actually perfectly precise fin height definition that also helps uh, SY fin here. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor Saha. Uh, now I uh, over to Professor Sinha. Uh, Hello. Uh, any other question, uh, Ratul? Uh, there are questions, but uh, those are very common common questions, and we are almost one and a half hour. So yeah. I think, yeah, we can go to the next speaker. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor thank you, Saha. Professor, Professor sure, thank you from my side as thank you from the organizer side uh, for giving such innovative a illuminating lecture on the topic and i i can sense that the 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 audience has a lot of questions i think they can uh, discuss with you over phone or over mail or the other yeah, yes. uh, yeah, sure, sure. Sure. because uh, these are the questions which uh, inquisitiveness uh, they have for research and further research now many of them are the researchers those participants, I came to know. So, uh, please, thank you again, once again. Professor Sarah. Sure, thank you. Nah, thank you. So, Ratul, may now uh, uh, ask for the next? Uh, uh, Professor uh, Srina, so uh, our next speaker has not joined yet. So, he's yeah, joining. That's what I have seen. That's what yeah, I yeah. So, he's joining shortly, uh, maybe. Yeah because his time is from uh, 11.35. Uh, 11. Let us, yeah, 35. We have almost five minutes. Let us wait for a few minutes. Yeah. Can I minutes left. Next speaker, can I interact with you, Professor Saha? <laughs> Professor Saha. Hello. Because uh, the next speaker has not joined. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think we can continue the discussion. Tell discussion. The sure. uh, Professor Saha. Yes. Actually, we are working on RF circuit design. One of the two research scholars who has done PhD under me. Actually, we have seen that uh, this type of device or whatever devices you have, which especially whatever we are talking, especially in the, it is in the low frequency region probably. This, uh, this device model, device are used in low frequency. So, mm -hmm. yes. So, uh, when you use a uh, high frequency, then a lot of problem will be there. Regarding um, your uh, parasitic, parasitic effects, because uh, your, uh, there be, due to this parasitic we will have a lot of problem in uh, noise margin as well as the, um, uh, your uh, 
uh, scatter plot just s1 on parameter s2 to parameter these parameters we have to check check return loss different return loss is there so how to tackle this problem actually noise regarding noise noise will be that much because you don't have uh, uh, doping doping is very low so that it is like fin fat right doping is very low so as a result what happened is one of the noise uh, that is uh, uh, due to uh, uh, due to uh, uh, due to mobility fluctuation or uh, or uh, mo mobility fluctuation or uh, carrier fluctuation that that part will be very low right so noise will be uh, noise will not be that much problem noise so margin is good go ahead. noise margin is good what can you noise be good noise margin will be good because of uh, undoped because noise have uh, noise is because of interaction or well, yeah you guys you join already so well, because of uh, uh, mobility fluctuation and then carrier fluctuation at the interface right so that will be low so as a result i think the uh, noise margin will be better so you guys have joined so what about the return loss just one minute what what are the return losses well, i didn't follow what was that Return loss, return losses, return loss is very uh, is a problematic. Hello, Samar. How are you? Hey, oh, good. How how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. All right, everything everything okay there? Yeah, everything is fine in the campus. A lot of the students have returned here. Okay. So, but travel hey, is restricted. Yeah. Hey, uh, everything is fine in the campus. A lot of the students have returned here. Okay. So, but travel hey, is restricted. Yeah. Hey, uh, I have not talked to you before. Uh, after uh, so congratulations on uh, two things uh, on your fellow and uh, uh, compact model company. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ratul, uh, uh, I think I welcome uh, Professor Yuges S. Chauhan, who has just joined. Okay, now please announce. Ratul? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, welcome Professor Chauhan, and uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Chauhan with the participants. And for your kind information, there are around uh, 600 participants. Uh, from different countries uh, for this webinar, one day webinar. And so uh, I'd like to introduce you to the uh, uh, participants. So Professor uh, Yugesh Singh Chauhan is a professor at IIT Kanpur, India. He was with IBM Bangalore during 2007 to 2010, Tokyo Institute of Technology in 2010, and University of California Berkeley during 2010 to 2002, Acro Electronics during 2003 to 2004. He is the developer of several industry standard models like ASM, GAN, HEMT models, BSIM, Bulk, formerly BSI M6, BSIM CMG, BSIM IMG, BSIM 4, and BSIM SY models. His research group is involved in developing compact models for GIN transistors, FIN FET, and it gate all around FETs, and FD SOI transistors, negative capacitance FETs, and 2D FETs. His research interests are characterization of semiconductor devices. He is the fellow of IEEE, editor of IEEE transactions on electron devices, electronic devices, and distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Electron Devices Society. He is the member of the IEEE EDS, Compact Modeling Committee. He is the founding chairperson of IEEE Electron Devices Society, UP chapter, and vice chairman of IEEE UP, IEEE A, UP section. He has published more than 200 papers in international journals and conferences. He received Ramanujan Fellowship in 2000, 
12 IBM faculty award faculty award Uh, Ratul, I can't hear anything. Yeah, Professor Sohan, there was uh, uh, a network issue. Now I think it's fine. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Would you like yes, to start sorry. now? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, you, you start. Let me see this. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. this is okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Professor. Uh, you can full screen it probably. Uh, full screen. Can you uh, do you see full screen or no? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's fine. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah, fine. Okay, okay. Thank you. So uh, let me talk about today on negative capacitance transistor, which is an emerging device. A lot of research is going on on this topic. So before I start, uh, this is my group and all the work I am presenting is actually done by the students. Uh, I have a large number of students uh, under me. We regularly publish in journals and conferences. We also have a device characterization laboratory where we have state of the art equipment for device characterization. It is, it can be used for uh, silicon as well as GAN transistors. Uh, so we have pulsed IV, pulsed RF system, network analyzers. Uh, we have parameter analyzers for both low power and high power, load pool system, noise figure analyzer, etc. And I encourage uh, participants to uh, if they are interested in uh, measurements of devices, uh, they can write us and uh, we can facilitate that. So uh, my group here at IIT Kanpur is working uh, all the way from theory to applications. Uh, we are doing atomistic simulations of materials, working on the semiconductor physics, transport, uh, developing spice models, doing the device characterization, also doing some fabrication and also working on RF. Uh, we work very closely with semiconductor companies and also with other universities on development of models, uh, uh, device characterization, and uh, circuit design. So what is a compact model? Uh, you see that this is a luxury vehicle and this is a compact model. So if you compare this, uh, TCAT simulation can give you all the information, more detailed physics, uh, but a compact model when we talk about is a model which is compact in form and it gives us the terminal characteristics. That means we can get the current function of external biases, we can get the function of external biases. So uh, once we have a good device in the foundry, then we need to pass that information to circuit designers and this medium of information exchange is through compact model or also called a spice model. A model should be accurate. That means it should be able to produce the trustworthy simulations results and match with the measurements. A parameter extraction strategy should be easy. 
and this balance between the accuracy and simplicity of the model depends on end application uh, a model must excellent convergence so your simulation should not fail during the simulation uh, time is critical because uh, circuit designers don't want to wait for a long time and accuracy requirements are very high when we talk about the um, matching it with the measurements so this is just some examples our bsim models our asm model etc there is a compact model uh, standardization body called compact model coalition cmc and cmc members are all the companies which are either foundries or the maker idms fabless companies etc and you can visit this website for more information about compact model coalition so what are the challenges in compact modeling uh, you see we have to work all the way from materials depending on the properties of different materials we have to take into account then look into the physics part so including like quantum mechanical effect transport which can be wave diffusion ballistic uh, then also look into the mathematical aspects so uh, implementation speed uh, algorithms smoothing function etc and finally we need to keep into mind the end application which might be digital analog rf so depending on the applications your model must be able to support those simulations so some snapshots from our working on all the working on all the bsim models uh, in fact my team here works on models and we regularly release these models to the industry and we also continue to do research on these topics to further improve the models so here bsim bulk is for bulk mosfet soi is for pdsy and uh, cmg is for finfet and gate all around and img is for fdsy transistor uh, we have been working also on the 2d transistors so this is just some showing some validation uh, of 2d model with the data and including the trapping effects this is the circuit simulation results uh, which we have uh, shown using our model uh, we are also looking into the 35 uh, channel transistors for logic application and especially in these uh, since their effective mass is low we start uh, 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 given that extremely small channel thicknesses the density of states starts affecting so we start seeing the 2d that's why you see that we start seeing this hum and you know that 2d density of states are constant so constant for one band and then going to another band again it's a constant and this effect is very prominent in the on the gate capacitance also we see same similar issues in the gm you can see that there are humps in gm which is uh, coming from uh, 2d density of states uh, we are also working on the quasi ballistic transport uh, this is especially applicable for a uh, very small channel length devices so here uh, we are showing you for the nano wire transistor and uh, in this nano wire transistor especially for circular geometry for a uh, very thin channel we start seeing 1d density of states so this is this is what we are seeing that uh, the gate capacitance start showing the peaks which are coming from uh, 1d density of states and this is the model validation on the measurement data uh we are also working on uh, insulator metal transition uh, material based transistor uh, which show hysteresis which you are seeing here and this uh, resistance is high at low temperature but when the resist temperature increases the resistance goes down so it goes from insulator to metal and uh, this is since this is a function of temperature it can be used in the transistor and because of the heating in the transistor we can have the switching which uh, you can see this is how it affects the uh, uh, current characteristics in the transistor and here uh, this is the current versus voltage and you can see as voltage is increased uh, suddenly you see that current goes large value and that's because uh, there is a transition from uh, insulator to metal this is the book which we have written on finfet uh, this talks about all uh, this has all the information about uh, bsim cmg model and we have also written a book on bsim img model uh, which is for fdsy transistor i encourage you to look into both of these books for more details on these models
So uh, just to give you also idea about our ASM GAN HEMT model, uh, this is world's first industry standard spice model for gallium nitride transistor. Uh, you can download the model and manual from this website and it was approved uh, to be industry standard in early 2018. And these devices are also very hot topic uh, are being used especially both RF and power applications. So now let me talk transistor. So we very well know this is the drain current versus gate voltage <clears throat> and if we want to reduce the power we have to reduce the VVD but if we reduce VVD ion will go down and ion if you want to keep same you have to shift the threshold voltage and if you shift threshold voltage your current which is off current goes up exponentially. So that's a big problem uh, in a state of the art devices. And this slope is characterized by what is called subthreshold swing. Uh, this subthreshold swing is uh, how much gate voltage change is required to get one decade increase in the drain current or one decade decrease in the decade current. So this is given by del VG by del log ID. And uh, then at room temperature, this is uh, one plus C semiconductor by C insulator into 60 millivolt per decade. So you can see that this slope uh, uh, swing is minimum 60 millivolt per decade. That means here, uh, if you change threshold voltage, this off current will go down and use this off current. Right? So uh, just before I talk about uh, negative capacitance, let's just take into look of the definition of capacitance. So the definition you can either give in terms of the uh, inverse curvature of free energy density, one by del square G by del P square, or also the slope of polarization versus electric field curve. Based on this, we can define two types of nonlinear dielectric. One is paraelectric, uh, which will not when we remove the electric field. And the ferroelectric is where there will be two possible states of polarization when electric field is removed. So uh, based on this, you can see the charge versus voltage for a capacitor, normal capacitor is a has positive slope or a positive this is the curvature of energy versus charge uh, if there is something which is a negative capacitor then it will have a, a slope which is negative or the invert, inverted uh, parabola and this kind of characteristic is found in ferroelectric materials you can see here uh, this is a double well curve uh, for energy versus uh, polarization or charge and here in this you have negative a signature of negative capacitance. Okay, and uh, this is the same. Uh, so the paraelectric material, if you see the polarization versus electric field, you can see it passes through a region. That means when we remove the electric field, there will be no polarization. In case of ferroelectric materials, you can see there is a hysteresis curve. So there is a polarization here, and there are two stable states at uh, e equal to zero. And what's the origin of this? Uh, this, uh, if you see a paraelectric material has centrosymmetry, so this atom at the center here at e equal to zero, it gives you p equal to zero. In case of ferroelectric, it's a non-centrosymmetric structure, so this atom which is here is moved, and it will be either in this position or this position depending on the applied electric field. So this is what gives us the hysteresis or double well curve. And you can also see this, the paraelectric material will have this uh, parabola characteristics with a positive uh, uh, curvature. And in this case, uh, we will have a double well curve. So there is this region where you are seeing uh, uh, negative capacitance signature. Now, in terms of modeling of this ferroelectric, so there any nonlinear dielectric is can be characterized by this free energy equation in terms of polarization and generally these parameters alpha beta are positive or negative but gamma is always positive for stability reason. Uh, so the dynamics we can also have the variation with time this is given by this equation this is a landau kalatnikov equation and in the steady state we can take this dp by dt is zero so we can have a relation between electric field and polarization and this relation uh, if we have alpha greater than zero, then at e equal to zero, we only see there is a one root at p equal to zero. 
so this is a parametric method but if alpha is negative then at e equal to 0 we one is the p equal to 0 other one are the plus minus pr which are remnant polarization okay so that's why we have a ferroelectric material that can have non zero polarization at zero electric field giving us the stresses so uh, if we uh, see it in the plot you can easily see that uh, for e equal to 0 uh, we have this uh, uh, this equation and from this uh, the solution is here at the center here and in this case we have uh, two of these are stable solutions so one is this one is this and that's why we have hysteresis okay uh, in ferroelectrics so two solutions are which are these ones and there is this third solution at e equal to zero uh, so this is a p equal to zero right uh, and you can see this one has negative slope and that is the region where we have a negative capacitance so both of these red regions are negative capacitance okay and this is not a stable region because you see the energy is maxima here so this is actually unstable region now if you apply electric field in a ferroelectric material uh, you start seeing this is how the energy uh, polarization versus electric field curve or energy versus polarization curve will behave so how do we stabilize this negative capacitance because you saw that it is it was at the peak uh, here so that's not the max uh, that's not a stable region so what we can do is we can add a, a, a normal dielectric material along with this uh, ferroelectric material so that total capacitance is or total free energy of a system has a minimum right and we can go through these equations and what you will see that uh, uh, all this will say that for a stable system the modulus of this ferroelectric capacitance should be greater than the dielectric capacitance if that's the case then this will give us a, a stable region and where we can still utilize the negative capacitance so this is to say again same thing that the total capacitance should remain or the uh, uh, magnitude of this ferroelectric capacitance should be greater than the semiconductor or dielectric capacitance whatever is added in series with the ferroelectric material or ferroelectric capacitance and this was also demonstrated by uh, asif khan uh, in apl paper in 2011 that how do can we stabilize this ferroelectric uh, negative capacitance and this was also uh, experimentally demonstrated that uh, uh, you know that when the two capacitances are in series uh, we see that uh, if both are positive the total uh, in series will give us less than each of these but if there is a negative capacitance then the total capacitance will be more than dielectric capacitance and this is what has been shown experimentally uh, in by different groups and then later on uh, there were other systems which were analyzing like a series register along with this uh, ferroelectric uh, capacitance system showing the negative capacitance in these regions and then this was the demonstration from a uh, german group uh, dresden that uh, they were able to show that experimentally they were able to show this double well curve which you are seeing and this was one of the first demonstration of this s curve okay and this was the measurement technique where they swapped the voltage in this fashion measured the current and the calculated charges and then from that they were able to calculate the polarization value <clears throat> then uh, there have been also several demonstration of negative capacitance transistor uh, especially of interest is one of this demonstration where first time they showed that a uh, hafnium zirconium oxide has ferroelectricity and uh, this is especially useful because hafnium oxide is already used as the high k dielectric in the 300 mm process and uh, if we can somehow get the ferroelectricity in this material and we can get a negative capacitance then this is very useful so this was one of the demonstration first demonstration in idm 2015 on uh, showing the ferroelectricity in hafnium materials so there are two types of structures which have been studied in literature one is called this mfmis which is the metal ferroelectric metal uh, and then this is the transistor 
So uh, this is just to say that a ferroelectric capacitor has been added in series with the transistor. The other one is that ferroelectric directly on top of this oxide of the transistor. In this case, this internal voltage here will be varying from source to drain because the polarization is going to vary for non-zero V. In this case, this internal voltage will be considered constant. That means this internal gate voltage will be considered constant all over the uh, surface of this gate. Uh, so when we started our work, we started first with MFMIS and CFET modeling. Why? Because it is easier to do. Uh, you can easily see we can have here a series connection. So same thing we do in the modeling. We have a model for uh, uh, for transistor and we have a capacitor and we use that. Okay. So since there is internal metal gate, the we have equipotential surface and V in will be constant all over this uh, place, all over the gate. And then we consider these two as separate quantities. Okay, and so you see here, uh, this is metal, ferroelectric, metal, and then this is high K and then the silicon. So this is how we are doing the transistor part. We model using the uh, using the conventional transistor model, and then we have the ferroelectric connected in series. Okay. So first we validate the ferroelectric parameters using experimental data. So this is the PE curve or PV curve uh, experimental. We extract the alpha beta parameters from this experimental data, and then we use. Uh, 22 nanometer FinFET data uh, here, and that data is used to calibrate the BSIM CMG model, which is the only stand standard model for FinFET. So once we have both of these, uh, we use the Verilog code for LK model. We have written our own CAL code, and we also have a BSIM CMG code in FinFET, uh, for FinFET uh, in Verilog. A. We couple these two. And we need to make sure that since this requires charge, we pass the charge as an extra uh, uh, variable through a node. And then these are solved self-consistently in a spice. So uh, these are some of the equations. Uh, one of the important uh, parameter which we will talk is the gain. What is gain is that how much variation is there in the internal voltage when there is a change in the gate voltage. So this is given by del V int by del V G, which is uh, equal to the modulus of CFE minus divided by the difference of these two capacitors. So here you see uh, charge versus capacitance. Uh, this is actually, uh, you can also consider this as capacitance versus gate voltage. So this conventional gate capacitance, right? So as we increase the charge, when I say increase the charge, means increase the gate voltage, it increases and then it is, uh, this is the strong inverter. The ferroelectric capacitance also varies and you can see this is, this is this, these are the curves for different ferroelectric thickness. Uh, now, depending on the value of thickness, uh, this matching between these two uh, will improve and that's why we will start seeing better gain. But uh, this blue line is not acceptable because this is going to cause, uh, this will be entering in the instable region. So then we will start seeing the hysteresis from this one. Okay. So uh, let's analyze first the <coughs> IDVG curve uh, in the subthreshold region. Uh, you see this pink line is actually the uh, TFE equal to zero ferroelectric. Uh, then as we increase the ferroelectric thickness, the subthreshold swing improves. But if we continue to increase the uh, hysteresis because we are entering in the unstable region. And here is the subthreshold swing versus gate voltage. You can see subthreshold swing is going even below 60 millivolt per decade, which is the limit uh, for room temperature uh, operation of the transistor. <coughs> this is the on region. So you can see that this is your normal FinFET. But NCFET is giving us a better on current here for uh, a larger ferroelectric thickness. Again, we have hysteresis, which is because uh, total, total capacitance, when it goes negative, we start seeing the hysteresis. So also gain, which is here, right, as TFE is increasing capacity, we have here uh, on current, increase in on current. And this has been experimentally demonstrated also by several groups uh, in the world. 
and then we also look into the idvd characteristics so here you see idvd starts showing decrease in the current as we are increasing the drain voltage and this is because uh, uh, because the internal voltage is decreasing in uh, with increase in drain voltage and that is because your gate charge or polarization is decreasing so that's why your uh, idvd curves uh, is showing this decrease in current and uh, there have been again several demonstration in the literature on different this was even the nc fin fact by global foundry then another interesting observation here is the uh, dibble in conventional transistors we know drain induced barrier lowering is positive that means as we increase the drain voltage threshold voltage goes down uh, but in this case we start seeing negative dibble that means threshold voltage actually increases as we increase the drain voltage which is very interesting here that means we will get better on current along with that we also have better off current and why is that happening that's because as we increase drain voltage this barrier height increases and that barrier barrier height increasing that threshold voltage has uh, increased or the gate charge has gone down so you can see here dibble versus ferroelectric thickness uh, it is positive when it is a low thickness as we increase the thickness we are seeing here a negative drain induced barrier load and this is one of the experimental curve here showing that uh, for low drain voltage you have lower threshold voltage as you increase the drain voltage threshold voltage has uh, increased for high vds uh, there will be hysteresis uh, that is uh, region of instability and as we are increasing the tfe the sub threshold swing reduces on current and i of also reduces for high vd and this width of hysteresis is also a function of drain voltage because of its interaction uh, uh, of the ferroelectric capacitance with the uh, transistor capacitance so this id vd which was decreasing with uh, vd is uh, you can also plot the derivative of this which is gds versus vds and you start seeing there is a, this negative gds here or negative output differential resistance not only that uh, for some ferroelectric thickness here uh, we are using different ferroelectric you even start seeing hysteresis which again is because at certain uh, drain voltage it starts entering in the uh, instability and such characteristics have been also demonstrated you see that there is an improved uh, uh, current but also there uh, this negative dibble effect is coming into picture so we started with this reference fin fed data uh, which was red curve uh, the nc fed which we were able to design you can see is giving us lower off current and higher on current so if you want to use it for getting same on current then we can easily make this vdd by half uh, instead of 0.8 voltage we can have it 0.4 volt and we can get same on current and we will still will have better and uh, i off so you can see that i off has reduced by 83% any question till now uh, i can take questions in between uh, yeah uh, so uh, actually i have one question maybe we can uh, take at the end this is fine 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 with me okay 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 okay, okay. so uh, we also have studied what happens if the ferroelectric materials parameters are varied uh, what we see that low pr and high ec is reducing this uh, mod cfe that will leads to improved matching that's why i on by i off increases uh also the it gives us no substitute swing right and that is to say that it also gives you uh, a better io loss due to negative dibble uh, we also studied the intrinsic delay properties and we find that we study different cases what if nc fin fed is driving fin fed what if it is driving fin fed is driving nc fed etc so what we find that nc fin fed driving nc fin fed for high vdd the ion advantage which is there might be limited uh, because it needs to charge larger gate capacitance but it is out 
performing finfet at low vdd of course it is a function of uh, material parameters that means different ferroelectrics materials will give you uh, different results and then we also looked into the power and energy delay products we find that uh, nc finfet was advantage at low vdd uh, but he, uh, we have done further studies and uh, we find that uh, overall nc finfet actually gives us better results the next we studied is the mfis transistor so here you can see there is no internal metal in between that means here v int which is there will be varying from source to time so uh, since this polarization and v int are varying in the longitudinal direction uh, it is uh, it creates a problem in terms of modeling because now uh, the equations are implicit and we might have to look into some iterative method to solve these numerical equations so we actually came up with analytical method we model these charges first uh, in the explicit way and then we use those charges to calculate the capacitances and the current so uh, these are the plots of uh, currents versus uh, gate voltage and drain voltage so first you can see this is the comparison with full implicit calculation so they are matching perfectly and also we, it is very clear that nc fed gives you much better current compared to the uh, baseline fed and we start seeing also these humps in gm right which is actually coming from uh, the gain which is uh, coming from the capacitance matching in nc fed and this is uh, the experimental validation which we have done uh, on our model okay. uh, we also looked into the comparing mfis versus mfmis and what is interesting is that uh, since uh, this mfmis uh the gate voltage or internal gate voltage is constant or it's a same everywhere the polarized uh, the switching of dipoles is going to be same at same voltage for all the uh, all the uh, you know dipoles so that will give us a sharp you can see this sharp hysteresis curve but in case of mfis since dipoles are going to switch one by one depending on the a uh, polarization from source to drain we see that this hysteresis curve is much more smoother compared to the mfmis case. then we have also worked on the gate all around transistor uh, so the gate all around negative capacitance transistor again we develop the explicit model uh, uh, here and then we use that to show the validation again full implicit similar characteristics you start seeing on gm better current compared to the baseline fed and here this is the gds curve here okay. and we also have plotted the terminal charges capacitances here versus vgs and vds uh, we observe the peak and gate capacitance this peak and gate capacitance is coming coming from the gain which is resulting from the capacitance matching between the ferroelectric layer and the internal transistor uh, which is used another study we have done is comparing this mfmis uh, versus mfis so in mfi mis you see there is internal metal here and then uh, we already have modeled this uh, the strategy i already discussed in case of mfis since there is no internal metal the voltage uh, this v int is varying from source to drain to model this we break this in n number of transistors and we each of this is assumed to be similar to this and then we connect the performance the performance uh, is very similar to what we have uh, seen in case of uh, using explicit models so here we see that mf mis is giving us better results uh, reason being that the dipoles switch together compared to mfis where dipole switching is uh, one by one and uh here we have the detailed uh, let's say results uh, feel free to go through this publication which talks about why it is happening and how it is happening and here we also show the hysteresis behavior you can see here first that same thing that mf mis is showing here uh, very sharp hysteresis compared to the mf is where we have a smooth hysteresis and we also see uh, here that uh, these dipoles switching excuse me
so this is for different channel potential we will have this hysteresis at different gate voltages uh, we also looked into the uh, short channel effects so we have done the ticket simulation in comsol at that time uh, no other ticket simulator was supporting this so we developed our own models in comsol and studied this uh, characteristics for different channel lengths so interestingly what you see conventionally we know the short channel effects your threshold voltage goes down as we bring down the channel length but in this case the nc fat actually a threshold voltage is increasing and uh, also the sub threshold swing actually improves as we bring the channel length uh, down in nc fat compared to the baseline where actually sub threshold swing gets worse why is it happening the reason is actually there is Uh, there are uh, outer fringing here on both sides source side and uh, drain side which starts creating a halo like behavior in in the uh, band diagram you can see here this is the conduction band so here you have humps and that will uh, that's the reason why vt and sub threshold swings uh, are improving as we are uh, bringing down the channel okay and same is here shown uh, for mfmis since uh, here we have uh gate voltage or internal gate voltage is same so uh, there is no as such hum but overall characteristics it gives us better results compared to the baseline and here the same results sub threshold swing versus channel length you can see sub threshold swing is improving uh, as we are uh, decreasing the channel length and uh, this is the capacitance matching being shown here uh, so there is a fringing capacitance here and as we are bringing down the voltage gain voltage gain is improving and then we have also studied the spacer permittivity so uh, impact of how the uh, so if we increase the spacer permittivity outer fringing capacitance increases because uh, the matching is improving so that's why we have threshold voltage here and the sub threshold swing improving and this is the negative dimple you can see so as we increase the spacer thickness uh, fringing capacitance uh, increase Yeah, this increasing and the negative table is more pronounced in this uh, in this case and then we also studied the off region characteristics very similar behavior which we have studied the negative table is coming there because you can see as we increase the drain voltage you have increase in the barrier height which is giving us giving us the negative table. we also studied the source drain doping so here you see that how the doping is being changed Uh, for larger doping here you can see there is a uh, increase in barrier height again because your capacitance matching improved and here is uh, this is the potential and field distribution in mfis and mfis you can easily see that we have these outer fringing capacitance or outer fringing field lines which are actually giving us uh, capacitance matching and uh, giving us better results uh then we have studied the on region characteristics uh, here we start seeing that for long this is giving us better because the dipole switching is together and same is true even for the short channel transistor even 16 nanometer you are seeing that we have better characteristics uh, mfmis is showing a more negative table because you can see the, the dipoles are uh, going to switch together in mfmis and the impact of vd will be more pronounced compared to the mfis case where the impact of vd is more a uh, local effect okay and we have also studied the what will be the impact of quantum mechanical effects so quantum mechanical effects are known to degrade the capacitance so this is what we also see here that compared to the without quantum mechanical effects with quantum mechanical effects capacitance is actually decreasing this is for uh, uh, different uh, you know ferroelectric thickness you can see for a smaller ferroelectric thickness they are more or less giving same performance for larger ferroelectric thicknesses we start seeing more negative dimple especially in mfmis and uh, then there are questions whether it really works so this has been demonstrated by global foundry in the 300 mm process that actually uh in terms of speed these transistors nc fat can work even uh, up to very high frequency so this is a ring oscillator you can see the results being shown here up to 40 gigahertz 
and also they are shown here that the uh, the power also goes down then we studied also the circuits performance so here we are showing that uh, nc finfit based inverter uh, even if you don't have any hysteresis in the current characteristic you start seeing the hysteresis in uh, vtc curve of the inverter and that's because the, of the negative table here you see this negative table which starts giving you hysteresis in the vtc characteristic and then we have studied the sram how the effect of this nc fat will be so what we find uh, that here the read time reduced due to the increased dry current on current is better in nc fat write time is slower because the gate capacitance also increases so uh, that's what is increasing the gate capacitance average power we see that nc sram is giving better with lower standby leakage but that's happening at a small tfe because the advantage of uh, uh, lower surface load current can be used for a uh, small thing then we also did the full standard library characterization and then we see that compared to the baseline you can see here uh, this result here the number of these occurrences are uh, high at low gate delay so your delay has reduced compared to the baseline fact and that's is remarkable because this is a full standard cell library for 7 nanometer fin fat which we have characterized and we find that the delay improved in nc fat okay uh, then uh, we studied these three questions uh, one is that first one which is this uh, first plot what's the frequency increase due to nc fat under same voltage so if we keep the voltage same you can see here that uh, uh the uh, increase in frequency can be even up to 60% or so uh if we are using uh, this vdd of lower vdd uh then what's the frequency increase under same baseline power density so power density is same as baseline and you can see frequency can be close to 25% and what will be the minimum operating voltage along with the achieved power reduction under same performance criteria that means same frequency so here we see that power can be reduced even up to 50% that's really significant 50% decrease in power using these nc fat uh, library uh, <clears throat> then we have also studied the rf performance high frequency performance we did the characterization and then used the model to character so we have to do lot of uh, here self fitting and uh, gate capacity gate network fitting for our very good results using nc fat uh, because of the uh, again on current or better gm okay and then we studied also what will be the impact of process variations so here we are showing you that we here we have studied the variability in on off and threshold voltage on current off current and threshold voltage for variability in these parameters uh, what we find ion improvement is non monotonic with efe here you can see here it improves right uh i of decreases monotonically and uh vt decreases uh, monotonically with pf uh we also have done the process variation study in the ring oscillator uh results are uh, i would say uh, not so is uh, pro uh, promising depending on uh, you know what ferroelectric material and the parameters are chosen so uh, what are the open questions in this uh, domain uh, is still an open question is negative capacitance a static or transient phenomenon uh, then how can we explain better negative capacitance for example if i have to explain it to an undergraduate uh, it becomes difficult to explain the negative capacitance then there has been uh, there needs to be lot of study on the second order effects like what will be the impact of grain boundaries uh, and their sizes multi domain effects which are there in these uh, devices ferroelectric materials what will be the impact of this? there have been uh, some papers on, on this and also impact of ferroelectric thickness on both these grain boundaries and multi domain effects reliability is another area where we are studying and also other groups are studying what will be the impact of reliability especially because of the voltage gain which is there and with the impact of negative differential resistance or negative double on circuits it's still uh, an open topic uh, so to conclude the maintaining ion by if is one of the biggest challenge in new technology nodes negative capacitance one of the best choice 
we need to find a sweet material for ferroelectric. It seems that the hafnium zirconia oxide actually is pretty promising. Uh, also, the integration with conventional CMOS process it is a challenge, but there has been a lot of progress uh, recently, and our spice models uh, can be used for circuit simulation. Uh, if you are interested, uh, you can go through these papers which we have published, and I can share the slides uh, with the group. Thank you. So, thank you, Professor. Very enlightening and energetic talk. Uh, each slide it was very energetic so much. Uh, yeah, first of all, I think I said say congratulations uh, for your elevation to IEEE fellow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like a tutorial for me because I didn't work on uh, negative capacitance. Uh, recently, I was at Professor Alam's lab at Purdue. Uh, people follow your work very closely. Uh, I, yes, yeah. <laughs> I little bit heard about uh, your work and also discussed some points with them. Uh, so now my question is, uh, what are now switches? Uh, what are the issues to be overcome for negative capacitance uh, transistors to come to uh, consumer market? Uh, this is one and second thing is that uh, spice metals have already been developed uh, for circuit simulation for negative capacitance yeah so first question uh, what are the challenges i already discussed the open questions these are the challenges second there is still not so consensus on whether we really get this negative still the research is still going on whether really this is negative capacitance or not and a uh, lot of theory lot of uh, 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 experiments have been actually performed to answer this question uh, but it's still a uh, lot of research is still ongoing uh, but the spice models yes uh, our group has developed a lot of spice models and they are already uh, we have published a lot on this topic so if anybody needs that Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is uh, generally uh, we have uh, for a normal MOSFET we have positive dipole and here it's negative dipole. So as PD increases, so threshold voltage is, is also increasing. So will it decrease current or I mean how it is advantages for uh, negative capacitance? No, it is decreasing off current, but uh, uh, the on current is still increasing. So that's giving us advantage on both front, off current decreasing and on okay. current. Okay, okay, okay. I mean ion by IOP is even increasing. Okay, yeah. okay. Check on. Check on. Okay, so uh, Professor, can I take a few questions from students? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. So we have lots of students actually are very happy and uh, say thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm taking few questions. First one is from uh, Manus Kumar Parida. He is asking, how does the substrate of the FET? Uh, affect negative capacitance devices. So when you say substrate of FET is uh, to say that the doping uh, of the substrate or doping of the channel. Uh, so this is just to say that how the threshold voltage of conventional transistor will move. So it is all you have to see what is the capacitance curve you are getting for the baseline transistor and how is the capacitance matching. At the end that will decide the performance. Right. And second question he is asking, uh, can we do radiation induced damage studies using BSM models? Uh, no answer is no. We don't actually include the radiation models. Uh, we did publish a paper. Uh, it can be added from outside, but it's not generally available inside. Okay, so next question is by Dirakar sir. Uh, is there any advancement made in the field using organic uh, semiconductors for design of NC FET? I am not, uh, well, organic ferroelectrics are there like PVDF and there have been uh, some study, but uh, I don't know if uh, organic uh, Transistors uh, and organic NC, uh, ferroelectrics have been studied. Uh, some one needs to look into literature. 
ओके ओके थैंक यू सो अनदर क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम माय कॉलीग सो ही इज आस्किंग एम्पेरिकल मॉडलिंग ऑफ ए पैरामीटर इज लॉट्स ऑफ डाटा नीडेड टू बी ऑब्जर्वड एंड फिटेड सो इंस्टेड ऑफ गोइंग फॉर अ जनरलाइज्ड मॉडल दैट फिट्स ऑल द डाटा कैन वी हैव अ डिजाइन दैट इज बेस्ड ऑन सम लिमिट्स सो विल दैट वर्क और शुड वी फिट ऑल द पैरामीटर्स बिकॉज़ फिटिंग ऑल द पैरामीटर्स इज समटाइम्स वेरी टीडियस Uh, so first my point will be that uh, the model should not be empirical if it is physics based with it will have uh, less number of parameters and fitting will be easy so my suggestion is don't use empirical model right right so another fiinity in case of ms uh, mfis and circuit can you repeat Uh, how do you model phi int i mean input voltage in case of mfis and cfit phi Pro uh, probably he is asking about the uh, 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 i mean how generally uh, in normal mosfets we uh, kind of uh, uh, make the transistors in saturation regions or dunes so probably he is asking that yeah i am not sure if i understand the question so in a normal mosfet uh, by applying the input voltage uh, gate voltage so transistor will go from sub threshold to saturation region so in in nc fet how do you do that it's same thing uh, i still don't know uh, you have changed the gate voltage it goes from sub threshold to strong inversion if you increase drain voltage it goes from linear to saturation okay okay Okay, thank you so much, Professor. So we have few questions, but uh, those are very common. Probably I'm not reading all. Uh, yeah, thank you so if much. If there are more questions, you can also drop me and mail, and I can also answer. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for uh, accepting. So hopefully we'll get you in uh, near future again. Yeah, thank you, and I hope to visit uh, sometime in Tejpur University. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. Probably now I over to Professor Sinha. uh thank you professor chauhan for your nice talk and i see that interactions are there and there are uh, still questions because you are very active in the field and you are so i request uh, all the participants if you have more questions uh, than on multiple on other threads okay like on chatting or by interact with our expert today professor uh, chauhan professor chauhan thank you for being with us and i also welcome you to tejpur university whenever okay please do visit tejpur university and thank you, yeah, thank you for this invitation and i would love to come there yeah after this covid is over uh, it will be yeah. yeah. we are here to welcome you yeah. <laughs> So actually, Kaziranga National Park is very nearby, maybe 60 kilometers from here. So uh, you will like it. So do visit us. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, that yeah. will be another uh, region also. But uh, I would also like to visit actually you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
हेलो रूपम यस सर
Era tul. La tul. La tul. Tu ai hanei tu. Tu la tul telefon cu la. La tul telefon cu telefon cu la. Santru ma tu telefon cu la. Tu thirty sir. Tul cam. Ei, nu da. Poți să te iau. Poți să te iau. Inima să te iau. Telefonul poți să te
Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर टू थर्टी टू थर्टी नमस्कार प्रणाम सर प्रणाम प्रणाम सर प्रणाम प्रणाम पर ये जॉइन ना 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 दे जॉइन मुझे संपर माना शर्त है ना What is the total participant, uh, Ratul? Can you total number of participants? Uh, sir, actually, we had six uh, hundred registrations from seventeen different countries, but uh, almost eighty are online. Eighty, okay. Eighty are online. We expect them to increase. Now, Professor Mohapatra, na. शांतनु महापात्र यस सर यस रूपम आर यू ऑनलाइन रूपम गुस्वामी यस सर रूपम इज विथ मी रूपम आई फॉरगॉट टू कॉन्ग्रेस इन ईमेल थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच ओके कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन हैप्पी टू नो जान भल लगिले इज अ गुड रिकग्निशन टू यू टू द डिपार्टमेंट वी हैव गॉट नाइन पॉइंट थ्री लैक्स सेंसर एज कम और कंप्यूटर हर बार रातुल We have got nine point three lakhs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got. Uh, welcome, sir. Hi. Yeah. Uh, welcome, sir. Welcome. Yeah, after a long uh, time, long years actually. Yeah, yeah, long time. 
Professor Mahapatra, I am from PP South, HODC. Okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. And uh, recently, Dr. Atul Bolo has published a paper in Atmos Material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you got the news? Huh? Hello. Have you got this news or not? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I am telling you, he has published in Atmos Material. Okay, very good. <laughs> he's worked with, uh, he's done work with uh, Professor Alam. Oh, uh, Professor Alam. Okay, okay. Party University. Okay. Let's see what is that. Uh, so we will start maybe in uh, two, three minutes. Uh, we have two, three minutes with us. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Last time I, I went to ISC. Uh, two years before COVID, I met uh, Professor Bhatt. No, yes. Professor N.K. Bhatt, Navakan Bhatt. Navakan Bhatt, huh. or K.N. Yes, yes. I met him, he is very close to me. Hmm. We have a picture lab in the school university. So we have a close interaction with him. That day, sense, sense lab. Yeah, yeah. We have fabricated many things from uh, sense lab. Hmm. From from the artisan. That Hello. When you fabricate a device, they had. Uh, yes. Uh, they had this facility, right? I uh, am. That time, uh, Professor Arkisin has guided us. Hmm. It is an optic device. We have fabricated. <laughs> So, how to share the screen? Present now. Okay. Ah, yes, at the right hand side, you uh, click the present now. Okay. I am, okay. I am Professor Bhuya. Nice to meet you. Professor. Yes, yes. I am retired from the department, from ECE, uh, this department, uh, one month back only, one, two okay. months back. I have to quit and rejoin, so I am quitting and I will rejoin. Not required. Uh -huh. Uh, it is visible? Yeah, 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 this is fine. Uh, sir, probably uh, if you are ready. Okay, yes. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to all the dignitaries and students. Uh, let us start with the post last session. Uh, in this session, we are lucky to have with us uh, Professor Mahapatra from ISC Bangalore and Professor Goswami from IIT Guwahati. Uh, I request Professor Puya to share this session. Sir, please. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all uh, participants, uh, the faculty members and uh, distinguished speaker, Professor S. Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Ratul has uh, requested me to share this session. Uh, although today is uh, Saturday, <laughs> I thought that it will be nice to uh, spend this time 
on holiday with a webinar. So I agreed and uh, I'm happy to see uh, Professor Mahapatra, uh, uh, who is going to speak on a very specialized topic. Uh, uh, for uh, for others, those who do not know Professor Mahapatra, uh, I like to give a, give a brief uh, uh, his uh, biodata uh, about his academics and uh, research. Uh, Professor Mahapatra is a B from Jadavpur University in the Department of Electronics and Telecommunication in 1999. Uh, he MTech in uh, he did his MTech in electrical engineering with a specialization microelectronics in 2001 from IIT Kanpur. Uh, PhD he did from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Lausanne in 2005, and his PhD dissertation was uh, on the topic uh, modeling of single electron transistor and its core simulation and core design with CMOS. Uh, positions he is holding now, uh, actually he joined as a, an assistant professor in the Department of Electronic Systems Engineering. Earlier this, this uh, department was CDTI uh, in mm -hmm. IIT, ISC Bangalore, uh, uh, he joined in 2005. And then he became the associate professor in 2010 and then full professor in 2015. Uh, he is also an adjunct faculty member of IIIT Allahabad. Uh, am I correct, uh, Professor Mahapatra? If there yes, is yes. mistake in the uh, copy and paste of your uh, biodata from your yes, yes. Uh, so research, he is uh, the founded uh, the nanoscale device research laboratory for modeling of carrier transport in nanomaterials at circuit device and atmospheric at, at level atomistic level and also he did uh, walk uh, he walked in 2d channel transistor energy efficient electronic switches and energy storage nanoscale levels he authored a book uh, hybrid CMOS sing single electron transistor device and circuit design he has got uh, many awards uh, uh, for his research and uh, contribution to the uh, scientific society, technology uh, society. Uh, he received the IBM faculty award in 2007, Microsoft Research India Outstanding Faculty Award in 2007, Associateship of Indian Academy of Mind. He is also recipient of Ramanna Fellowship during 2012 and 2015 in the discipline of electrical sciences from Department of Science and Technology, Doctor of India, for his contribution in compact, compact modeling. He is a senior member of IEEE, Electron Device of Society, and also very prestigious uh, Indian journal, Shadhana, uh, you know. Uh, so this brief uh, uh, is introduction. I welcome uh, Professor Mahapatra to this webinar on uh, devices, nanoscale devices and sensors. And uh, uh, I wish that all the participants uh, we will be uh, attending this seminar, this topic, Atom to Circuit Modeling Techniques for Emerging Nanomaterial Based MOSFETs. So, I request Professor Mahapatra to proceed to his lecture and uh, the questions from participants. Probably it will be in the inbox of uh, uh, YouTube because this has been viewed, uh, a provision is there for viewing in YouTube by uh, Dr. Atul Bolwa. So any question that will be answered by the, that will be read by the, read by uh, Atul Bolwa and uh, it will be answered uh, by the distinguished uh, uh, the, the speaker. So thank you all of you. Thank you for joining. Professor Mahapatra, please. OK, thank you, Professor, uh, for the introduction. And good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so today I will talk about a new uh, device modeling methodology which connects uh, atom to circuit, that means material to circuit. 
and uh, this is a new technique we have developed in our lab and for and we apply it for emerging nanomaterial that is uh, 2d material mainly uh, with most transistors and uh, so before uh, i don't want to give a very long introduction about uh, why 2d material why it is because uh, it is now very well known rather uh, i would like to introduce you that why it is seriously being considered as a cmos technology extension and we call it the flat land real estate for the cmos technology extension and here you can see that how the things are evolving uh, here you can see two track one is material and another is circuit okay and material device and circuit so first is 2004 the exfoliation of graphene it started then 2011 this is just one decade ex exactly one decade back uh, Professor Kiss from EPFL, they first demonstrated MOS2 based transistor, single monolayer MOS2 based transistor. And then everything started. So then it evolves like 2014 with black phosphorus in then Germanen and very, very recently from UC Berkeley, I guess, uh, Tellurine transistor. So, how we are exploring new 2D materials from MOS to uh, phosphorine, black phosphorus, and the others. And anyhow, that could be interesting for a material or device people. But again, why we are talking about CMOS technology extension, that is how it is being applied. That is here you see just a single device. But as an electronics engineer, we are interested that if this technology could be translated to make a chip or integrated circuit. So that actually started again, same group, Professor Keys 2011 uh, by MOS2 based logic circuit, then ring oscillator, then inverter, memory cell, then in 2017 from Austria, it is MOS2 based microprocessor, and very recently, even from the same group, it is the op -amp. So here you can see that why people are very serious, both the government and industries, uh, they are investing a lot of money to this technology. Uh, that is the 2D material based technology for CMOS technology extension. Okay. So this is the idea, the, you know, one slide, the big picture. And let's go ahead and what is the, I mean, uh, I mean this is the, you know, fabrication, and the experiments are being conducted, but what is being done? I mean, we need to do for the modeling of the device. Okay. Now, uh, this is one motivation for our uh, this atom to circuit modeling methodology. Why we are doing this thing? So, as I have shown in last slide, so in 2010, just a decade back, it started with MOS2. And then other TMDs, TMDs means transition metal dichalcogenide, like MOS2 is one of them, then WS2, WAC2, and many of them. So metal is the transition metal, and uh, sulfur, selenium, these are the chalcogenide group material. Then silicin, German, NA, etc. Okay. Now, uh, the thing is that earlier, you know, what we have, we have only silicon. Then maybe germanium, now we are talking about three, five, I mean, only handful of bulk material that are being explored uh, for the transistor channel material, right? But now here in um, 2D material, the thing you see, it is the, now the plethora of this material. And these are, this, this, these are the commercial vendor of this 2D material. Uh, here, I mean, um, all over the world, even in India, I see they purchase the 2D material mainly from these two companies. There are other companies also, and they do experiment. And they have almost like 200 plus material, different material with them, which is commercially readily available. Okay. And in the side, we have different database. Okay. These are database for 2D material by so-called computational explosion technique. And here they host thousand plus material. Okay. 
so now the question is that you know i mean which is good so why i am saying this thing that new material they brings with the new property so that is good but inception of any new material in industrial process process integration phase it is a very lengthy complex and capital intensive affair okay and so it is good if i have so many choices where i will put the money okay so among several choices the question is that even before we invest something okay even at the very advanced level of technology development even before the wafer is available okay we want to know what is really hot and what is not and so it requires a new kind of modeling framework that will connect material to the circuit and what it will do it will do a systematic evaluation of material at device and circuit level at the early stage of technology development even before the wafer is available okay so the key question is that how to predict circuit performance just from the crystallography formation of the material okay so we actually try to arrest understand this question uh, under uh, try to answer this question and try to uh, give a solution which is very important now for the semiconductor industry at very early stage of this 2d material development now uh, so what i uh, again in this slide so let's think the problem from top down okay so here you can see that uh, this is a basic mosfet uh, silicon mosfet bulk and this is the circuit of a cmos inverter the basic building block of any digital logic and here uh, you know you can see the characteristics of a cmos inverter and uh, mainly we are interested in this vm which is known as the threshold point of the inverter and uh, as if you have read a little bit of cmos circuit theory uh, you can uh, you can remember that this vm or i have written it in terms of threshold voltage of inverter not the threshold voltage of mosfet so vm equation okay and here it is vt is the threshold voltage of n n channel device and vt 0p is the threshold voltage of p channel device and the supply voltage and this kr and what is kr as you know it is the product of mobility c ox w by l okay and this is the channel resistance now as you know for the symmetric operation of mosfet uh, for the cmos inverter you want this vth to be half the vdd okay so that we try to design and uh, for that you have to be kn by kp should be equal to 1 and as you know that uh, because of the difference of the mobility of uh, p channel and n channel mosfet for silicon uh, for symmetric operation the p mosfet uh, w by l ratio you know that it should be like 2 to 3 times higher than the n channel okay now the question is that so this is the equation a circuit engineers knows okay now the question is that if i change the channel material even change it from 3d to 2d how this equation will change okay and in the equation where really the material property is hidden okay so it is hidden inside mobility okay mobility again mobility depends on what mobility as you see it will depend on two things one is the effective mass of the electron and something called electron phonon coupling okay so the phonon property and the electron property okay but this you don't see in this equation it is hidden so if you change the material both of this thing will change the phonon and the electron and how that will affect the mobility okay and here where is the density of states okay so effective mass has two role one is that it controls the mobility another thing it controls the density of states of the material and where is the density of states in this equation okay you don't see it nowhere 
actually it is hidden it is hidden within the threshold voltage okay so effective mass is affecting both the threshold voltage and the mobility but it is hidden okay i mean i cannot find either the electron band structure information or phonon structure information or uh, density of states etc anywhere in this situation okay so if you change that these are actually material property so so if you change the material how that will change this major matrix okay so it is not trivial and especially when we move from a 3d material to 2d material because now the electrons they are confined in two direction okay so we try to develop a modeling methodology uh, if we can connect material directly with this thing if i change anything about material it will get you know reflected in this equation then actually this kind of modeling framework uh, at very advanced level just from the crystallographic uh, property of material i can predict the circuit behavior okay that we are trying to do here now i am going uh, to the you know another aspect of this thing so uh, when i am changing uh, our you know very old good uh, bulk silicon or uh, nowadays it is nanoware silicon or fin fed with silicon with a new material what are the things we want to know uh, from a industry perspective or a um, uh, you know device designer or circuit designer's perspective when i am bringing the new material first thing is that the transistor scaling limit that is how much i can scale down the transistor it again depends on the material property okay because uh, ultimate scaling limit it is determined by the uh, source to drain tunneling okay and it depends on again the effective mass and the material property okay so this is one thing and another thing that is the you know rf analog those type of circuit okay where it is not really very scaled down and there if i change the material how those circuit will behave okay or how the frequency of a ring oscillator it will change so i have no other information apart from the i know the crystallographic structure from just from this information how i can predict this behavior okay so these are two extreme because here we use the quantum transport model and here we are it is the diffusive limit so diffusive model okay so here we work in this two domain Uh, but i would say the first one not only us several other groups you, you, you can see i mean they work on this energy transport and they try to do this transistor scaling limit many many papers are there okay and once you get this thing there are some empirical rule set by which you can somehow get a estimation here but this is a empirical rule set okay it is applied for some standard circuit it doesn't sits within the spice where you can design any circuit as you like okay and the second one rather it is a unique one and uh, to our best knowledge only our methodology using that you can reach from material to device through the device to the circuit and you can do circuit simulation even at the nqs limit i will this i will explain what is the nqs limit that means extremely high frequency close to the cut off frequency of the transistor so in this talk i mainly discuss about this root okay the atom to circuit modeling methodology okay before that the first one that is from material to device and answering this question how much i can scale the device so here how it is done again it is a two two level of abstraction okay one is material and another is device okay so modeling happens in two level of abstraction and more or less i have shown you some papers from our group there are also papers from other group and there are many many papers i mean many people even you know this there are tool kit is also available like uh, quantum etk okay and now um, this uh, nemo 
which was developed at Purdue University. Now it it has become a part of the Silvaco toolkit. So and this is um, uh, so quantum etiquette is now part of the synopsis ticket. So it is now commercially available. So what it is done that uh, we, 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 we use uh, density functional theory for the material modeling and there we calculate some material parameter which is interesting, which is useful for uh, um, which dictates the property of any transistor like dielectric constant then the phonon dispersion from there we get the deformation potential which is used to calculate the mobility in uh, semi-classical sense or in um, uh, electron phonon scattering if you would like to do quantum transport then the electronic band structure then from electronic band structure we develop the hamiltonian and then we entered in the device modeling part this is so called NEGF based quantum transport method where you solve the uh, Poisson equation and the transport equation uh, self consistently uh, uh, with this this outer loop until it converts and we solve all of this green function and uh, this complex equation in order to get the current okay so means that from the first principle we say that if i know the material crystal structure i can calculate the current okay terminal current the gate capacitance and ultimately what we want to see is that um, you know for a new material for a given gate length uh, what is the you know energy and the switching delay this plot and here as you can see there are new material new many new material we can compare them for different uh, channel length or technology node whatever you can say and here uh, this is the itrs roadmap irds now that they say and uh, you can compare with this new material how far i can push the uh, the technology roadmap okay so this is the two material and device two scale okay so two level of abstraction and uh, these are the modeling methodology that is being used okay all over the world now there are you know uh, main uh, issue is that how you uh, calibrate the hamiltonian and the nature of hamiltonian like uh, this toolkit like quantum ATK, they they use uh, they develop uh, something called dft energy formalism that is the band structure is calculated by density functional theory and it is a very big hamiltonian and they use it and uh, but there are other methods like we use much simpler hamiltonian that is k dot p uh, that is much faster but the thing is that it is the low energy hamiltonian then there is a new technique that is called mlwf that is maximally localized one year function which is now which is in between that is it captures the material uh, chemistry properly but it is not um, as slow as the uh, DFT energy formalism. Okay, so there are different kind of formalism people use it. Now uh, we we uh, but uh, one thing I would like to tell you uh, this uh, this uh, solution this self consistent loop this is very time consuming and especially when you introduce this the blue line that is the electron phonon uh, scattering it really slows down the thing so you need really high performance uh, computer to do this kind of calculation okay now we move forward now again coming back a little bit to the technology i have already told you uh, i have shown you in the very first slide how technology is evolving this field it is very very fast one example is this one so the idea was uh, why we are using the 2d material as a um, replacement of silicon as you know that uh, by geometry scaling means we are trying to scale down the channel length okay now in order to preserve the electrostatic integrity we at the same time we have to thin down the channel that's why nowadays you see this fin fed the body is very thin okay or this nano sheet 
uh, go uh, get all around MOSFET that is um, developed by this IBM. So earlier for bulk uh, MOSFET, the thickness of the body you can say it is infinite. Now body is limited. So it says that as you scale down the channel length, you also need to thin down the body. Okay. So you can say virtually your body thickness is tending towards zero. Okay. That means body less. So actually that is the idea. Uh, it is very difficult to make uh, bulk material thin. I mean a silicon very thin. But think about um, if I get a material which is kind of thickness less or thickness is only few atomic layer. Okay, so then using this material, if I can replace the MOSFET. Okay, so that is the idea. So uh, I can look for a semiconductor which is uh, atomically thin and I try to use it as a replacement of the silicon channel. That is the very best. And this is the again one decade back, the EPFL group they first demonstrated the monolayer MOS2 and then see how fast it is evolving. Then in 2004, okay, 14, only four years, okay. So they came up with an idea that why you only replace the channel with 2D material because the MOSFET is not only channel, you have uh, gate oxide and you have electrodes, okay. So I can uh, find a 2D equivalent electrical equivalent of the gate oxide and uh, 2D electrical equivalent of all of these electrodes that is gate electrode drain and source and then uh, it develops like all 2D MOSFET where channel is uh, some 2D material uh, which is semiconducting in nature then gate oxide is another 2D material which is um, uh, insulating in nature like HBN and uh, the gate material or source and drain material, another uh, 2D material which is metallic in nature and obvious choice is graphene. So if you just stack it up, then see that is the beauty. I mean here you have to fabricate a device, okay, you go to clean room, do several chemical thing, ion bombardment, etc. Uh, to make the source and drain and you here you just stack three different, three, four different, and it will become a MOSFET, okay. And see, it is showing like MOSFET characteristics, okay. So that is the beauty of this uh, 2D material. Just by stacking, you can achieve a device property, <coughs> okay. And this happened, how fast this uh, area is moving, <coughs> that within four years, we move from here to here. Okay, now here again, I would like to spend few words here. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, I would like to remember what uh, Professor Kromar, uh, that is the Nobel uh, laureate in uh, physics in 2000, said that uh, something remarkable that is the in future interface will be the device. Okay, what does this mean? See, if you think about a diode, okay, what is the difference between a material? and a device, okay. A device is made upon a few materials, okay. A material is not interesting at all because material, if you put two electrodes at the end of, uh, of a material, it will just behave like a register, right. But when you bring two material together and make a interface, okay, junction, then the whole thing, it behaves a uh, device and it shows remarkable characteristics. For example, a PN junction diode, okay, it is same silicon, but one side is P and one side is N. So two different ma material it became, then you make a junction, then it behaves like a rectifying junction. It can allow only say positive signal, it will not allow the negative signal to pass, okay. So the novel properties of device, it actually comes from the interface of the constituent material, okay. Now, but like uh, in the same way, we developed a MOSFET. So there you have two junction, uh, one is source drain, then drain, uh, one is source channel, then another is channel drain. And on the top, you have another interface that is uh, your channel to get material and then from uh, get material to the, uh, sorry, get oxide and then get oxide to the get material. Okay, so, so many interfaces. Okay, now 
as you scale down the device what is happening you achieve something like this okay now here what you will call this thing it is a interface or it is a device okay or it is both so then what he predicted you know long time back 20 years back that in future interface will be uh, happen, will become like a device that is actually happened with the discovery and the uh, development of this 2d material technology that today you cannot say if this thing it is a interface or it is a device okay so here it is becoming very important when i model this device to study the atomistic property of the interface that actually raise uh, this point this atomistic property how to capture it in your device model and also in the circuit property so that is the main motivation for developing such atom to circuit modeling methodology so here briefly how it goes so in our first work actually we developed a model for this all 2d mosfet okay the thing i have just shown you so we start with the material then we do atomistic modeling mainly we apply density functional theory here and there are geometry optimization etc so two main thing one is the band structure and from band structure we get the effective mass and uh, the phonon band structure from phonon band structure and electron band structure when we something called deformation potential theory we get the value of the mobility okay so these are all calculated at the atomistic level and for there the input is only the crystal structure nothing else so that is the imp one important thing uh, as i shown you i mean at the beginning there are many materials which are commercially available many times they are not properly characterized or there are much much more material they are available theoretically in the database okay where you don't have any knowledge of the device with some basic apart from basic knowledge you have not synthesized it you have not characterized you don't have in one uh, line you don't have any experimental data so if for a material if you don't have any experimental data still how i can predict Uh, just from the crystallographic property the device property and the circuit property okay so that is the idea and then we go uh, the, then we this is one abstraction that is the material level abstraction or atomic level abstraction then we move to device level okay so we gather all of this information so the dielectric constant and from band structure we develop the hamiltonian then we use the capacitor model like a mos capacitor model here one important thing how we are different from uh, silicon is that or in silicon we always use uh, the uh, boltzmann distribution okay that is the 3d distribution and that is for the 3d movement of the carrier okay but here since it is a 2d material we use the fermi dirac distribution it has a big impact in modeling as you know that um, when we write a simple mosfet equation like id equals to um, uh, this um, mu w by l c ox vg minus vt whole square so in the development of this equation somewhere you use something called einstein relationship right that is diffusivity by the mobility it is equals to kt over q okay so if you remember this equation that holds only when you are under the boltzmann distribution so actually you cannot apply this relationship when it is fermi dirac distribution okay so you have to do something else that is called we introduce a concept called bias dependent diffusivity okay so that is used here that is the again because of the fermi dirac distribution so this things are changing when i am moving from 3d to 2d then as usual the way we um, uh, the model a silicon mosfet in the similar approach we first develop the code model that is with the long channel we consider then gradual channel approximation same drip diffusion formalism with a small change it would no more be following the einstein relationship okay 
Then the linearization, then we get the drain current model, we apply the partition scheme, then we get the terminal chart. So drain current model is only useful for DC simulation, okay? But you need to add the terminal chart so you can do the transient or small signal analysis. When it is done, then the device level abstraction is over. I move to circuit. So we implement all of this equation in SPICE. Then we design the circuit and even small circuit like inverter or big circuit like ring oscillator and we get the analysis. So this is the, you can say a big black box. Here the input is material and the output is the circuit response. Okay, that the thing uh, is, we call it the atom to circuit modeling methodology and this is purely first principle based just i have the crystal in my hand no other information is there okay now here i spent a little time on the mobility calculation it is a very important parameter as you know because we always look for high mobility device so by first principle there are different method just from crystallographic property how you will predict the mobility okay so as you know mobility has two components mainly low field mobility and high field mobility by high field mobility we mean that the velocity saturation part and low field mobility generally we use a deformation potential theory so in short it is like that when you uh, calculate the band structure of any solid or any crystal so here you assume that all the atoms are fixed right they are not moving but uh, phonon means that the atoms they are moving okay so because of the movement of the that is the vibration of atoms how much the dispersion of the electron it will change that is called the deformation potential okay so deformation potential as you can understand this is link it links the electron dispersion and the phonon dispersion and the coupling between the electron and phonon which actually dictates mainly at room temperature mobility that is the low field mobility okay so here there are many methods okay mainly most of the time we use this one uh, this tagak it is acoustic phonon based and now even there is a very recent paper even by machine learning you can predict it then there is another paper um, uh, it says that see i mean when you do the phonon spectrum uh, this is a harmonic oscillation based right but if there is any non-harmonic component how you will do it so this paper <coughs> it does another new technique they do molecular dynamics where they can capture the a non-harmonic motion and they couple it with uh, Landau transport and then they calculate the mobility. They again, again, if you, these are all fine for low field mobility, but when you go for high field, you need the uh, different, uh, the optical phonon information and the different need, then you can either put it in Boltzmann transport equation, then you do Monte Carlo and from there you can get the mobility field relationship and then how to but that is very complex thing how to use it in a circuit simulator then you have this called a thomas model that i will show you you just calibrate that model uh, using uh, this empirical model but you can calibrate with this monte carlo result and using this calibration parameter you can use it for compact modeling for the circuit simulation okay now <laughs> mobility is again it is very interesting topic in 2d materials many paper okay initially <coughs> so once you know you are replacing silicon with a 2d material and one thing is okay it is thin but another important thing if it is mobility is higher than so here actually when at the initial days of the 2d material even the very first paper in 2010 that is the MOS transistor you will see they have reported the mobility of mos to very high value then immediately in the next paper they have corrected it okay so initially it was thought that is this 2d material because we have uh, you know graphene in our mind that 2d material will have very high mobility but really 
later stage, this is a very recent paper, last only few months back from Texas Austin. Actually, it is found that 2D material has very poor mobility. And they have given a postulate, like a theory, or um, saying that, uh, that um, giving a, a final verdict, like that all the 2D material or uh, low mobility is actually an intrinsic property of the 2D material. The 2D material cannot ever have a high mobility. Why the reason? It has to do something about the density of scattering with the parabolic band structure. So all the 2D material, it will have very low mobility and that will have an important aspect of our model development and why the non quasi static model are important. Okay. Now, uh, again, uh, all 2D, we, so this is uh, very dense, okay, very, I mean, fast, I, I don't want to go in very detail, so just the methodology. So what we do, first we make this atomic structure, uh, here we have used the quantum ATK or any DFT tool, you can make this atomic structure and then you relax the structure, you have to make the supercell so that the between them is very less. And then um, uh, you can have the, uh, you can relax the structure, then you can do the band structure calculation. And as you know, when you put, you know, the graphene on top of HBN, graphene is usually gapless, but when you put on top of the symmetry between, you will have a band gap opening, as I have shown here. Now, as you reduce, as you reduce the graphene intel, if you change the intel layer between and the HBN, you can actually control the band gap opening. I mean, if the distance is small, the band gap opening will be high. If the distance is large, the band gap will get vanished. Okay. It is similar to, you can say, the polydepletion effect in MOS transistor. Okay. But why you are doing it, you can argue that uh, how I can control it. But the idea is here that um, during the process variation, uh, the band gap, uh, it is not in our control, but it is an emulation process that I can control the band gap and by, by the varying the distance between HBN and graphene. And in this way, we can capture any kind of band gap variation. So that is the idea. Now here, uh, uh, we will show how this band gap, okay, band gap variation, it will be reflected to a circuit which will be built upon such uh, all to the MOS transistor, okay. Then uh, slowly, again, it is the physics, I mean, uh, why the band gap opens. Uh, like it is also by atomistic modeling, we can determine that the carbon atom is sitting on boron or carbon atom is sitting on nothing. And this is the most the energetically favorable configuration. Then we develop a Hamiltonian for graphing with this band gap opening. If you make delta equals to zero, it falls to the linear dispersion of graphene, but when delta is non-zero, it will give you the parabolic dispersion close to the uh, Dirac point, okay. And uh, then uh, we have also the low energy dispersion Hamiltonian for graphene, and we have the dispersion for the MOS2, it is same parabolic dispersion. When you know this thing, then actually you can fit, that I am saying, you, you get the DFT data, then you can fit your simple Hamiltonian across the DFT data. So this is fitted. That means the material property I am uh, capturing or material property I am mapping in my Hamiltonian. Once you have the Hamiltonian, then I can calculate the uh, density of states. And once you have the density of state, this is the as your own MOS capacitor circuit. So one difference is that here it is a composed of three capacitance. This is the gate oxide capacitance. Here it is HBN. This is the quantum capacitance of graphene and this is the quantum capacitance of MOS2. They are in series. And then you can solve this potential balance equation and the charge balance equation. Okay. And here we are using, as you can see, no more Boltzmann. It is the Fermi Dirac. Okay, but for silicon, you remember you always write n equals to ni e to the power 
E minus C F by K T. So that is Boltzmann. Okay, but here it is ln one plus this part is coming. Okay, so when uh, this part is very big, then it is going towards the Boltzmann. Okay. So and then you get similar to any silicon MOSFET model, something called the surface potential equation, which says when you apply the terminal voltage, what would be the value of the surface potential? Okay. So when you have the surface potential, then you can apply the deep diffusion model, calculate the drain current. Now here comes the catch. Okay. Now here for silicon or any 3D material, apply here directly D by mu equals to KT by Q. Okay, that we cannot apply it here because this formula it is applicable only for the Boltzmann distribution. So what you do, we make ID, we write D in terms of mobility through this equation. How come? Actually, we make this equals to zero and then we calculate what D equals to the expression. So this equation, you, as you can see, D is, is a function of bias, but we ensure at VDS equals to zero, current equals to zero. So this is a way around and then uh, to handle this Einstein relationship problem under uh, Fermi Dirac distribution and uh, uh, and uh, uh, then the diffusivity is bias dependent so it creates a lot of problem when we develop the high frequency model okay another point is that as i told you the band cap opening in graphene this is again if you have studied little bit of compact modeling this is a technique we use called charge linearization which means for a given bias condition from source to drain the relationship between the surface potential and the inversion charge it is generally linear okay in bulk MOSFET okay but as you can see as I am decreasing HBN and graphene we introduce the uh, band gap in the graphene and this linear characteristics it is becoming a non-linear okay so polarization scheme we cannot apply here so here we apply something called non-linear it is a non-linear behavior, so we use something called piecewise linearization technique. And using it, we calculate the terminal charge. Now we have everything ready, drain current, DC current, and all the terminal charge. So this equation, so these are the equation. So it looks big, but these are simple polynomial. Okay, that could be easily implemented in a spy simulator. And then we simulate it. Uh, then we take the equation, put it in very log A form and develop the AMS model. And now it is inside SPICE. And then we can design different kind of circuitry. And here you can say simple CMOS inverter. And then many of this CMOS inverter, we can put it in a chain and close the loop. Then it will become odd number of inverters. It will become a ring oscillator. Okay. And here you see red, blue and green. So these are the interlayer distance between the HBN and graphene and the resultant thing is that the band gap opening. Okay. So the band gap opening in graphene now I can capture in the frequency of a ring oscillator. Okay. So a mesosphena, I mean band gap opening is graphene that is happening because of the sublattice symmetry breaking between HBN and the graphene that how it could be reflected uh, in a circuit when you make a device using this material. Okay. So here this is the our not in nutshell the atom to circuit modeling methodology. Okay. Now quickly timing is over almost. <coughs> so far one thing the model we developed that is called the quasi static it works under quasi static limit. Okay. What does it mean? It means in a simple way that uh, you know uh, the carriers they are moving from source to drain and it takes some time to move from source to drain. We call it it is the transit time approximately it is L square by mu Vt. Okay. Now when we developed the previous model, we completely neglected this phenomena that is the transit time. So is it good or bad? So it is actually fine as long as my operating frequency, it is 
I mean the rate of change of the signal at the terminal it is smaller than the transit time. So we say generally it is found when the every transistor has a cutoff frequency. Okay, so cutoff frequency is nothing but this one over tau you can say. And when I am operating it lower than the cutoff frequency, half of the cutoff frequency, lower than the cutoff frequency, then the quasi static model it just works fine. But when you are moving, above, then you have to take into account this parameter. Okay, why? Then it is mainly very, very important mainly for this 2D material because as I have told you, 2D material they actually offer you very low mobility low mobility means low ft okay now if the ft is low then you have a model which is valid only ft by 2 so your design space is really coming down okay so <coughs> for 2d material if you would like to recover the another ft by 2 this model i mean you need to take into account it is very very important for this 2d material then I would say rather silicon. We are happy with the quasi static model. And also, you can argue that uh, I can increase the FT by lowering the channel, and that happens for silicon or the bulk material. But here, the technology is such that scaling down the channel length is very challenging for silicon technology because of other issues with um, lithography okay that is a different topic altogether so it is very difficult i mean to achieve a high ft uh, transistor in 2d material and so we need to develop a model which can takes into account this transit time so that i can increase the design space okay so there are generally two approach one is continuity equation based and one is relaxation time based here we have adopted both of the method and here we apply again another new material called uh, phosphorine okay it is the monolayer black phosphorus and we will show that see that this type of thing can also be done it has two transport direction armchair and zigzag and you can develop a model where you can orient the channel at any time so here also same thing we first do the density functional theory we calculate the effective mass band structure then we take a low energy to band kp hamiltonian and then we fit it we get all the uh, information then like previously we develop a much now it is much simpler uh, because we don't have this kind of stacking and surface potential equation and now equation are much simpler and uh, the same the bias dependent divisibility and the drain current but here now the mobility it is function of theta theta is the uh, orientation of the channel so in one armchair direction mobility and the zigzag direction mobility we again have calculated i mean we have not calculated we have taken it from other reference where they have calculated as i mentioned before by monte carlo technique and then we can get you know this theta dependence orientation dependence the dc current model and even the theta dependence of the cutoff frequency okay then uh, the terminal charge in the same way but now we try to introduce this uh, the inertia for that what we do that we the, we, we 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 take this equation dc drain current and put it in the continuity equation so we get this pd okay in silicon also we get the similar thing i mean non quasi static modeling is not new but with 2d material it comes with this added complexity this term is not there in case of silicon mosfet and when this term is there it is almost impossible to solve this pd for any arbitrary output input so unless you know this term in advance that is you know how the signal will change in advance otherwise it is not possible to solve this pd so for special cases that is when i know the signal in advance that is i know that i am going to apply a square pulse or i am going to apply a sinusoid it is possible to solve it and finally you see that is the thing the difference between it is simple that uh, my VD is one volt. I just apply a step voltage in the MOSFET 
and step is like some rise time and fall time and the difference is that the solid line they are the non quasi static model and the this abrupt line there are the quasi static model and you can see this is unphysical it cannot change this abruptly but the non quasi static model it is gradual so here is the high frequency part where you can see it fails the quasi static model but when it goes to low frequency both are converging together so that is the thing okay at high frequency then even you can calculate all the y parameter again you see here i don't have any experimental data phosphorin crystal information but from that i can predict everything even the y parameter how y parameter will change with the frequency and even we can predict something very important for circuit uh, designer that is called the distortion analysis the harmonic distortion when you design this high frequency passive mixer it is very important and here you can see that the non quasi static model they can correctly predict the second and third order harmonic distortion which is not captured okay then again i can include the uh, uh velocity saturation again by monte carlo i can get the velocity saturation and i this is the famous coggy thomas equation and you calibrate it many people do mistake here they just take this value of sigma to be either 1 and 2 which is reported for silicon and then they apply directly for 2d material that should not be done first of all you first calculate the velocity versus electric field for that particular 2d material by this monte carlo technique and then you calibrate it so you can see the value we got it is very different from silicon okay and for electron and the uh, holes they are also different okay so include all of this thing that and finally we include we what we do that there is another modeling technique that is called rtfs model which is easy to be as i told you that equation we cannot solve for any arbitrary input voltage so we transfer it to a something called rtfs model then calibrate this rtfs model against the continuity based model then we implement it in a circuit simulator then we do the this is a uh, inverter circuit and this is same circuit as you know if you have a little bit knowledge of circuit theory same circuit i can use it as a logic inverter or as an amplifier load and as you can see the difference between quasi static it cannot predict the high frequency part properly but with non quasi static it takes care here also with the high frequency part it is giving physical increasing but in non quasi static it is proper so that is the power of this modeling scheme and that from the crystallographic property i can even initially i show it is the logic design performance but i can also design you know very high frequency analog circuit okay taking into account the inertia okay. and this is the final thought i mean our modeling scheme what it does that we have to end you have defined kind of material modeling tool like quantum etc vast etc and another hand you have industry standard uh, spice and what our model does it bridges between this two end okay and connects the material to the circuit so any new material or in the industry who are exploring the new material uh, for you know advanced technology node this model will be helpful for them they can get a very advanced assessment of any new 2d material at a device and subtle and how good they could be uh, for integrated circuit performance okay and i acknowledge this work is done by one of my just graduated student bishop priyo he just defended um, uh, last week uh, he did his mtep from uh, besu shipu and these are the two papers um, that you can go through i mean all the things you will get here i mean it i was very fast but all the technical details are here and uh, yeah this is our lab web website if you are interested uh, you can go through it this is my email id and yeah i mean especially as you know our institute um, 
our research program uh, our portal is just open so any students who are interested in doing phd recommend you can contact me you can go through the website and uh, that's it uh, thank you very much uh, yeah i can take few questions okay thank you so much sir for for very very uh, enlightening talk it's really nice to hear you uh, i have few questions from uh, students uh, probably i can read for you yeah yeah so what is uh, out of different 2d materials mos2 graphene etc which one has uh, more prospect in terms of fabrication and uh, in the market okay as you can see most of the efforts are going towards mos2 because mono layer realization uh, i mean most i mean it is the most research material so probably and uh, also abundance in nature as you know that mos2 has been used as lubricant for long time so that is also another thing that uh, you know it is cheap it is uh, available so it looks like hbn graphene mos2 those materials are easy to build because people has um, uh, spend a lot of time and it is well researched so they have better future but again as i told you that mobility is a issue uh, if the other 2d material has better mobility and it is under exploration there are so many materials and i am not a really uh, but uh, i mean these are well researched so they have uh, much i mean uh, time to market could be less for this this materials thank you sir uh, another question from uh, mr bora uh, among quantum transport and diffusive transport uh, yeah. which is better no it is not better the one thing that you have to understand that there are different model and every model has certain application limit and uh, there is nothing called better or non better one thing is that when you make the transistor very small uh, then uh, this the carriers are mostly out of the equilibrium okay there are very less scattering so there this drip diffusion methodology it is no more old good okay so there we use this quantum transport method and quantum transport method as i told you it is so computationally heavy it is very difficult to extend it for longer channel device okay and then one can argue that for longer channel since the scattering is enough so i can safely use my uh, deep diffusion model okay so it is like that what you want to do so when i as i said when i talk about the scalability how small i can make it that is i am really going for smaller device okay so there i will use the quantum transform model but normal circuit operation where the channel length is biggest uh, model because that is well tested for circuit modeling or compact modeling purpose so it is just the application so it is nothing like which is bigger everything has a advantage and disadvantage and applicability domain you have to understand what is the applicability domain and then you have to apply it accordingly okay thank you sir uh, another question from uh, dr goswami uh, is it true that mobility of graphene uh, reduces when it is used to form a device like fet because of its interface with other materials Uh, yeah the see i mean uh, mobility of graphene is very high that is the pristine material okay so again i mean if it is not the pristine form the mobility the mobility will be lower but here uh, but there is, uh, don't i mean uh, i made uh, this statement there is not point so here uh, don't uh, get me in uh, don't mistaken me what i said if you see that paper it says that the 2d semiconductor has a intrinsic low mobility two dimensional semiconductor so graphene is not a semiconductor this is a 
semi metallic it has this dirac foam so this statement it is applicable for 2d semiconductor that is which has gap and you can see that is the gap and it has a parabolic dispersion so this thing again it is applicable this theory is applicable only for 2d semiconductor okay graphene is not semiconductor uh, yes sir uh, thank you sir another question student has asked uh, what is mean by orientation uh, theta uh, of the channel okay as you know i give you example like you know silicon wafer right we always say it is 1 o o right so that is a particular direction okay there are other direction of silicon also 1 1 1 okay so here it is in the crystal in which direction the transport is occurring that is the direction so here where it is so this is a piece of phosphor direction and in this direction every direction the band structure will be different and so the slope of the band structure that is the effective mass so if you carrier moves in this direction it will have different effective mass different scattering in this direction different effective mass different scattering in this direction different effective mass different scattering so in all of this direction the mobility will be different okay so it depends how you will design your device and which direction so it just means source is here and pain is here or source is pain is here in this direction it is going yeah th uh, thank you sir i am taking the last question actually students have many questions uh, yes. in the interest of time probably i am taking the uh, last question uh, says miss ananda uh, her question is uh, will the manufacture of 2d material based transistors could be accommodated with uh, silicon device manufacturing process here yeah, that is always the idea uh, because you know uh, even not going far for uh, the 2d material if you think about uh, 3 5 okay so any new material that should be over silicon our wafer is always silicon and it should be grown over silicon so that is called the cvd technique so even this 2d material it should so, yeah, even you can see i mean people are demonstrating like i make etc they are demonstrating this is the large area growth this is the technology people are doing a lot of effort and how to go to the material in because uh, a uh, whatever you can purchase from this much the vendor it is just a small place you cannot make a integrated circuit okay professor yes uh, uh, i have one question actually uh, uh, you are using the band structure model in hamilton and you are using you are using the conic poly model because we have taken the phonon uh, uh, vibration over you that you मॉडल What do you use for that? That will be easier because already conic poly model is used in uh, 3D materials. The 2D material you can convert it like this way. How follow my question? No, no, no. I don't get it. I yeah, mean, problem. actually, you are using either what you used to do. Conic poly model you are using for device modeling. Conic poly model. Yeah, but chronic penny model it just explain uh, the origin of the band gap. I mean, chronic penny model neither. Uh, if I have a crystal structure uh, and I would like to calculate the band structure, the standard way to apply the I mean by chronic penny model you cannot. I mean, it gives the explanation of why there is a band structure is there in a crystal, but. Uh, Epithelium, epithelium, so it you can. can uh, 
we can uh, predict the effectiveness yeah, that's fine it will give you a band structure okay but here the idea is that i need to type different type of band structure one is the most accurate one that is coming from density function which is very complex okay it takes long time to simulate and another is very simple that is two band hamiltonian okay that i get it and fit across it. so that has to be very simple so that i can develop analytical relationship out of it as you can see conic penny model is not helping me to develop any kind of analytic equation it is just a model equation yeah i think there is lot yeah. of people than people are what yeah. okay yeah. so it's fine so it's fine, it's fine. it is Difficult to continue this communication. Yeah, yeah. So okay. thank you so much, sir. Thank you so okay. much for giving us time. Uh, okay. Now I over to Professor Puya. Yes. Uh, Professor Mahapatra, it was a very interesting talk uh, you delivered, and uh, starting from right from modeling. simulation to very minute theoretical uh, explanation you have given and i am not a person from this field but uh, still i understand many of the things that you have used like uh, modeling and uh, uh, how you simulate all the uh, your designs so uh, i hope that uh, uh, the participants has got a lot of uh, influence have influence of this talk on their uh, dream to do some work on this uh, right so i thank you very much once again and uh, uh, wish you all the best for a very uh, good day and have nice uh, presentation i once again thank for your contribution and your uh, talk thank you thank you mr prajapati thank you thank you yes sir uh, professor goswami sir uh, has already joined so to yes sir uh, yes uh, yeah professor goswami sir has already joined yeah. yes, professor goswami welcome hi uh, professor we are good afternoon good afternoon welcome to this uh, webinar yeah uh, i i have seen that you have you will be talking on uh, bioelectronics of bioelectrodes involved in amperometric and biofuel cell right. is it okay right. okay 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 so before uh, your talk i like to introduce yourself uh with uh, those who do not know about you uh, professor gushami from iit guwahati he is a phd from uh, guwahati university uh, in chemical biology and joined as a scientist at nist jorhat is a csir lab in 1990 then he moved to iit guwahati in 2002 and attained the level of professor in uh, acg grade acg in 2015 He served as a head in the Department of Bioscience and Bioengineering, head in the Center for Energy and Central Instrumentation Facility at IIT Guwahati itself, and he served as a visiting professor at University of Alberta, Canada, and uh, is a member nominee of the Senate to the Board of Governors IIT Guwahati. These are his uh, his position, but uh, in research. He has a lot of uh, contribution to the biosensor, with an emphasis on the development of novel biorecognition system and signal transduction platform, um, specifically for malaria, myocardial infarction, and alcohol detection, alcohol, uh, and many other uh, bio uh, chemical detection. He was a Boy Scout uh, Cust Fellow of DST. uh to the university of Mass massachusetts of boston his group has developed many novel optometers and rec as recognition of molecule for the detection and diagnosis of malaria 
and uh, efficient signal transduction through nanomaterial intervention for sensitive and selective detection of the target in primary activity in his uh, leadership. Then uh, a couple of proofs of concept developed in his lab has already been commercialized as a portable kit for detection of malaria, alcohol, methanol, and formaldehyde. Two of his kits have been dedicated to the nation by the Honorable HRD Minister of uh, India. Also, he published more than 1,000, one, sorry, 100 peer-reviewed scientific uh, papers and filed 11 patents uh, applications. Now he has supervised or uh, is supervising and he has already supervised many PhD students who have received uh, many accolades and awards uh, in the Outstanding Reviewers Awards from a reputed journal. He also served as an editor, real board member of two international scientific journals. So with this brief uh, introduction, I request Professor Gushami to deliver his talk uh, on the topic, uh, bioelectronics or bioelectrodes involved in amperometric and biofuel cells. So, Professor Gusami. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Gunya. Nice to meet you all. First mm -hmm. of all, I am thankful to all the members of the coordination committee, Dr. Natul Borwa, Dr. Rupam Gusami, Dr. Santanu Sarma, and uh, nice to meet you, Professor Bhia. And uh, uh, okay, now uh, I'll be uploading my PPT. Then I'll start start my talk. So here actually this platform I have used first time. Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, go to present now on the uh, right hand side bottom. Yeah, present, sir, present now. Right. Yeah, yeah, present now. And, yeah. and then yeah. A window. A window. Okay. Uh, A window, then uh, you my click PPT. your PPT. Uh, yeah, I have already opened my PPT. Yeah, you go to uh, present now, then A window. Yeah, I have to uh, click a window then. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you open the PPT first, you keep it open in your desktop. Okay. Uh, in your desktop, you opened the PPT. Yes, yes, I have opened my PPT. Okay, now you right hand side, there is a present now. Okay, <laughs> oh, in the right hand side, present now. Okay. Then a uh, window. Window. Then uh, okay. there may be uh, there may be um, uh, one or more uh, icons. Your yes. Do you see now? You select the PPT. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You full screen it probably. It is full screen. I have given. Uh, is it uh, go to present presentation mode? Is it is it not appearing in a full screen? Uh, it you is go full to presentation, mode, presentation mode. Your presentation mode. PPT presentation mode. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. no, here actually, yes, yes, yeah, 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 right, right. So, I am, uh, yes, 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 is it okay? Can you uh, see this screen Yes, we can see, but uh, your presentation mode is not yet coming. Uh, uh, now, you see, I have put presentation mode. You have seen your presentation mode, yes, yes, then, uh, then okay, fine, no problem. Could you see my uh, PPT properly? Yes, yes, it is visible. But for us, it is not in presentation mode. 
your ppt is coming but side by side your small ppt icons are also coming uh, okay. like sorry you uh, click f5 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 okay Ratul, I am uh, I am not sure whether it works or not in uh, presentation mode. Uh, okay, uh, otherwise this is fine, sir. You can go ahead with this. Fine, fine, fine. okay. This is fine. Yeah, you can go ahead. Full, full screen mode. Yeah, actually full screen mode is not seen for us, but this is fine. This is fine. You can go ahead, please. So just see whether how it is. What is about this one? Uh, in uh, in general, it should work, but uh, here probably it is not full screen yet. But uh, so this is fine. You can go ahead. Your yes, slide is okay. Slide is coming. No problem. Okay. You can continue. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Could you see my pointer? Yes, yes, yes. We can see that. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, please go ahead. Am I audible properly? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I am thankful to the organizing committee for um, inviting me to deliver this lecture on this micro nano electronic devices and sensors 2021. So the topic of my presentation is bioelectronics or bioelectrodes involved in embryometric and biofuel cell biosensors. So here I'll be talking to devices. One is embryometric and one is biofuel cell. And these two devices, I'll be talking in the context of biosensors application. So since I'll be talking in the context of biosensor application, so at the beginning, I'd like to give a brief uh, discussion on the fundamentals of biosensors. Then I'll be briefly describe what is biofuel cell and embryometric biosensors. Then I'll be talking about potential applications and market so biosensors, then generation of electrical response in bioelectrodes, challenges and solutions. Then at the end, I would like to highlight some of the representative work which is going on in my lab at IIT Guwahati. So coming to the biosensors, biosensor is basically, it is an analytical tool. It is a small, so it is a portable. It is a simple device so that it can be used by semi-skill operators and by patients themselves if it is for clinical applications. And it should be preferably inexpensive. Now, you might be aware about the biosensors which is available in the market. For example, the glucose biosensors, pregnancy test. These are nothing but biosensors. The biosensors are basically inspired by the natural sensors. You might have seen these plants this is easily available in our surroundings. In the common language, it is called you know, So if you touch the plants, the whole bunch of plants is collapsed. So this is one of the good examples of pressure sensor in natural environment. We need not have to go to the plant kingdom. The sensors are available with us. We have Ponso Indriya, as it is mentioned in our ethics. So this Ponso Indriya, as you know well, Radeno, Raneno, Pavano, Rispi, these are all basically natural sensors. These sensors are omnipresent. Uh, are, sir. are omnipresent. Even sensors are there, what we talk about current in the current situation in coronavirus. This coronavirus, COVID-2, it cannot enter our cells if it does not get the proper receptor on the cell surface. That receptor is called ACE2. So it's spikes protein will recognize these receptors, then only it can talk, and that then it can enter the cells to deliver its genetic materials for reproduction of this virus inside this cell. Sir. So what I'd like to say this. Uh, Gustav, sir. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Actually, slides are not moving. Uh, it is showing the first slide only. Oh, slide Or maybe you can send me the slides. I can uh, present for uh, you, here for you. 
you know, what is the problem? I actually, this system, uh, uh, can you tell me now this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now it's working, yeah, now it's working. Yeah, this is fine. Now it is moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is moving? Is it moving now? Uh, again, it is on the first slide. Can you please show us the second slide for you? Yeah, this is second slide. Uh, it's not moving. From, from the list of slides, you can see that. Oh. On the left. <laughs> what should I do now? Because these systems I have used first time. This yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so no issue. Uh, you please send, send me the PPT. I will uh, uh, present for you. Please send me the PPT in uh, Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, that will be giving a problem. In my system, I think it will be uh, running. Yeah, now, now actually, now we are seeing slide number three. Now we are seeing. No, this is basically in a no, not in a full screen. No, so for audience it will be difficult to see. So what I am doing, I can send you this yeah. PPT. Yeah, sure. It is taking some time for uploading actually. Uh, no problem, sir. No problem. Use uh, the Zoom and the Microsoft team. Yeah, right. <laughs> actually, uh, Google Meet has bought this uh, Google Meet one. Uh, okay, already I have sent you. Yeah. Have you received my mail? I could not see many participants actually. There is only seven participants are here. Professor Gusami. Yes, please. In fact, the, uh, there is a, another channel uh, through okay. YouTube. So YouTube, there is another channel which is view, viewed by many other other students. Okay, okay. So because Google Meet cannot accommodate many okay, uh, okay. limitations. So uh, is it uh, Dr. Atul? Yeah, now PPT is appearing. So can you please make it in a presentation form? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is fine, sir. Go ahead, please. Okay, okay. So uh, sorry, actually, this is the technical difficulties from my part. Uh, no anyway. problem, sir. No problem at all. 
Uh, this uh, my talk I'll be categorizing in the following subtopics as yes, these biosensors uh, will be central to these discussions in terms of this discussing the electronics of the bioelectron. So initially I'll be discussing briefly about how these biosensors. Then I'll be briefly describe biofuel cell and amperometric biosensors. Then I'll be talking about potential applications and markets of biosensors. Then uh, Next, I will talk about the generation electrical response in bioelectrodes, challenges and solutions. Then uh, at the end, I will highlight my work, some of the work which is going on in my laboratory. Now, as far as the biosensor is concerned, it is a small, so it is a portable. So they're capable of using by the semi skill operators or intend to develop for clinical applications. And it is preferably inexpensive. So you might, uh, this next. So you might have seen the biosensors which are available in the global market. In the local market also many of those biosensors are available. Please uh, give the next click. Okay. So uh, you might have seen these glucose sensors, pregnancy test. So these are the, some examples of biosensors which are available in the market. Uh, but these biosensors are these biosensors are basically an inspiration of the natural sensors. You might have seen these plants. When you touch the plants, these plants collapse. So this is a very good example of physical chemical signal transduction. So this is a pressure, something like a pressure sensor. We need not have to go to the plant kingdom. Sensing devices are with half itself. We have Ponso Indrio, we have Graneno, Sadeno, Srabono, Dristi. Say no, all these sensors are available with us. Even sensors are available in the smallest organisms on Earth, inside the cells, the virus. Can you click? So this virus, coronavirus, it cannot enter our cells if it does not identify the receptor protein on the cell surface. So this is also one specific example of you know sensing what is coronavirus. So these sensors which are available in the nature are quite amazing because they are highly selective. Use some specific functionalities which inspired to develop analytical based biosensor. So major impetus of these natural sensors are is their selectivity. The selectivity, if those molecules which are responsible for selectivity of the nature, several sensors can be extracted and developed an analytical tool, and that is the biosensors. So uh, please uh, click next. So biosensors should have some performance factors. Obviously, the first one is the selectivity, because as because it uses the biorecognition element from the natural systems, it should have fast response, preferably in seconds, and it should be sensitive. Sensitivity should go to the Submillimolar even to the femtomolar level depends on the requirement. And it should be accurate, at least better than plus minus 5%. It should be reproducible. It should be independent of physical parameters. While we are using the biosensors, because biosensors are mainly for point of care application and point of need applications, and uh, on site application. So there should not involve any physical uh, managing the physical parameters like temperature optimization, keys, and all those kind of things. So it should be completely independent of physical parameters. It should work in the room temperatures, normal PAs, and it should have short recovery time. Functionally, it should be stable. So basically, operational and both storage stability of the biosensors are good. Let's click next. So basically, if you see all these parameters, it is a decentralized testing facility. Particularly, it is used for point of care, home diagnosis, and on-site applications. So that means it is a suitable for remote locations in resource limiting environment. Please go to the next slide. So there is one mandate from World Health Organization. Is that, please, next. That whatever the diagnostics is to be developed for developing and particularly for developing and underdeveloped countries, it should follow the assured criteria. What is assured? Assured means A means F. S means sensitive and specific. U means user friendly, R means repeat, E means equipment free, and D means deliverable. Next slide, please. 
So as far as the application of biosensors is concerned, there are huge applications in various diverse fields, starting from water quality management, prosthetic device, drug delivery, disease detections, environmental monitoring, soil quality monitoring, food quality monitoring, toxins in defense interest, for example, detection of any defense uh, terrorism, bioterrorism like agents like anthrax, coronavirus even, then those kind of uh, toxin producing organisms or highly uh, virulent organisms, toxins. nowadays there is no proven technology for those. And uh, nowadays mostly sniffing dogs are used, but that sniffing dogs has also the limitations. So there is a great demand of developing repeat detection test for on-site detection of all these materials. Please go to the next slide. There is one agency they have surveyed, which is called Market and Market Research Private Limited. And as per their survey, that survey for 2019 to 2014, the compound annual growth rate of the biosensors is 8.3. Please click next. But this survey, they have focused mainly on North America. And they are focusing mainly that uh, lifestyle diseases like uh, heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, obesity, arthritis, and all these kind of things. So there is a great demand of developing biosensors for these kind of things. But in our country, like a developing and underdeveloped countries, apart from these lifestyle diseases, we have another disease burden for which we need biosensors. We have various infectious diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, diarrhea, calazar, and all those kind of things. Those are basically not very much predominant in developed countries. So we have these disease burdens provoked us to develop uh, these biosensors. This is our additional requirement, apart from all those lifestyle diseases. Next slide, please. So now coming to the general configuration of the biosensors. If you talk about the biosensors configuration, uh, I think, is it, uh, can it be a little bit, make it full screen? OK. So it has a, basically five components. First is the sample analytes. Second is the recognition element. The recognition element is mostly receptors, antigen, antibody, enzyme, protein, nucleic acid, and all those kind of things, which can selectively detect the target of your interest in the sample. And the next is the transducers. The function of the transducers is to transduce the biochemical or biophysical signals into electrical signals. And then once that it transduced this signal to electrical output, that signal is then amplified and then it ejected to the data processors and displays. So these are the basic components of a biosensors. But as far as these two components are concerned, recognition element and the transducers, these are very, very important as far as the sensor development is concerned. The recognition element, obviously, as I have already mentioned, that these are basically extracted from the natural sensors or biological systems. And elements are preferably to immobilized on the surface of the transducers. There are different kinds of transducers are here. Primarily, these are the major transducers. One is electrochemical, optical, mass sense, and calorimetry. So these are the major uh, uh, transducers. Uh, please click next. So now, as far as the biofuel cell and amperometric devices are concerned, these are belongs to the electrochemical. Uh, this biofuel cell basically it works in a voltammetric principles, mainly galvanometric principles, and the uh, photometric is the amperometric. So basically, why these two devices are very important? These are very fast in terms of response, very sensitive, very selective, and there is no extra label is required like optical detection systems or other sensors, there is no level, external level is required for developing these sensors. And sample volumes, even sometimes no sample loss is there because if micro needles of these things can be introduced and the uh, sample loss is not there. And uh, there is a now proven technology for miniaturizing these systems to smaller devices. Next slide, please. So now coming to the amperometric biosensors. If we see the amperometric biosensors, basically the system is something like that. It involves mainly three different kinds of electrodes. One is working electrode, one is auxiliary electrode, and another is the reference electrode. The function of that working electrode is that it 
all these biomolecules are by recognition the lipid cells are really immobilized on the surface of the working electron so this is the main electron to sense the analyte of interest in the sample the function of the reference electron is to manage the potential which is involved because here a bias potential is to be applied so that potential which is required in the system surge in the area which refers to the reference electron is manages the potential and the function of the auxiliary electron is to manage the current the system can also be used but in that case the system will take more burden because in the same reference electron if we take care of current and potential that sometimes aberration develop so it is preferred three electrode system apart from working electrode there will be two other electrodes this next clip uh okay now this uh, amperometric sensors yes it is works on the electrode now how it is works i am just showing a schematic over here suppose this is reaction o o is you, we need to detect this compound o on the sample then we will have to apply a potential on the electrode Now, what is potential? Potential is nothing but the energy required to move the charge because its unit is joule per coulomb, right? So that means you are charging this uh, energy of the electron, which is electron. The energy of the electron in the electron, you can accordingly reduce or oxidize the compound of your interest. And while reducing or oxidizing the compounds, the electron exchange which will be taking place. That electron exchange, basically, that electron exchange means that will be the current. So that means you can measure the current and uh, you can correlate the concentration of the analyte with the amplitude of the current. Uh, next, click please. So now, as I have already mentioned, the voltage can alter the energy of the electron in the electrode in Fermi level energy. It is corresponding to the energy of the highest occupied molecular orbitals of the metals. Next slide. Next, click please. so depending upon the position of the fermi level it may thermodynamically feasible to reduce or oxidize the species in solution i can explain these things in the next slide suppose if we want to detect the compound o and we want to reduce the compound by applying a potential when we reduce the compound by applying a potential the electrons which will flowing there for reduction will will generate in the form of a current next click please so that can be best explained how that mechanism is involved in the potentiometry in the amperometric sensor next click please so here this is the metal electrode and this here what this is the energy the, it is the fermi energy of the electrons of the metal now this is the molecule o it is in the close contact with the elect metal electrode now it has in the highest uh, outer orbit homo and homo i think all of you know ever lowest occupied molecular orbital and highest occupied molecular now under this situation if you see the energy of the lumo of o is higher than the fermi energy of the metal so this molecule will not be reduced because electron cannot jump from that electrode to the lumo so what we do next click please so what we do we apply a voltage so when we apply a voltage basically negative voltage when we apply there it will energize the electron on the fermi level and then as a result of that energy of the electron in the fermi level will drastically increase and then fermi level energy of the electron will be higher than the lumo under that situation the electron from that electrode can jump to the lumo of the o molecule o then o will be reduced so, uh, so uh, i have not yet completed please so uh, this energy of the lumo is thermodynamically favorable for the electron transport to occur so this is the mechanism what is potential and how why it is applied in a amperometric systems and what is the mechanism for the detection of the analyte through amperometric system this is the basic next slide please so i am coming with, a, with an example suppose if we want to detect glucose then using glucose oxidase as a bio recognition element now under this situation what happen glucose oxidase will oxidize the glucose using oxygen from the atmospheric system so then glucose will be converted to gluconolactone product Form a co byproduct hydrogen peroxide. Now, in this case, you can detect glucose in two ways. Either you can measure the depletion of oxygen in the system because oxygen will be depleted in an airtight container, or you can measure the formation of hydrogen peroxide in the system. Now, for detection of oxygen, what you are doing, you are applying a negative potential because when you are applying a negative potential, that will energize the Fermi electron of the electron 
electron in the electrode and that will help to jump the electron from the electrode to the oxygen so that oxygen will be reduced to hydrogen peroxide. Or in case if you want to detect hydrogen peroxide, then you are essential. In that case, hydrogen peroxide will be oxidized. The electron will jump from hydrogen peroxide to the electron as because LUMO energy of the hydrogen peroxide will be higher than the Fermi energy of the electron of the metal. So either way, you can generate the response curve because this exchange of electron, whether it is oxygen or hydrogen peroxide, oxygen oxidation or reduction, the electrons which will be generated will be immersed as a current, and that current you can plot that in the, in the, against the concentration of the oxygen or hydrogen peroxide, and based on stoichiometry, you can plot this concentration against glucose. So this is the basic of biosensors. Next slide, please. Now, let me briefly describe what is biofuel cell. Now, uh, I will talk from the backside of the word biofuel cell. First, let me talk what is cell. Cell, as you know, in a common language, in our layman language, we, we call it battery, right? It is an electrochemical device that converts stored chemical. So energy is stored inside. So, so long the chemical energy of the material, then the battery or cell will work. Once that chemical energy is consumed, then the battery, we call it is down, right? So this is a thermodynamically closed system. Next click, please. So in case of fuel cell, uh, in case of fuel cell, this chemical energy is, is supplied from external sources. It is not stored inside. So that's why it is called thermodynamically open system. Next click, please. So this is a typical example of fuel cell. So I am talking about at this moment chemical fuel cell. Then next, I'll be talking what is biofuel cell. Now, as far as the general configuration of the concern, the chemical fuel cell and bio, because in chemical fuel cell and biofuel cell, in both these cases, two electrodes are involved. One is called anode, one is called a cathode. In between these two electrodes, an electrolyte is used. So here, I would like to exemplify how this chemical fuel cell works using hydrogen as a fuel. So when hydrogen is supplied from external environment, hydrogen will be oxidized in an anode Protons will be liberated, electrons will be liberated when you put a load outside here, load we are using on the electric bulb. So the proton will go through the electrolyte, electron will go through the outer circuit, and in the cathode, the cathodic catalyst, what it does, it takes the oxygen from that atmospheric oxygen in most cases, combining with the proton from the electrolyte, with the electron from the outer circuit, this oxygen is converted to water. So, this only product of this fuel cell is the water. Now, what is the difference between chemical fuel cell and biological fuel cell? Go to the next slide. So this is a biological fuel cell. The basic difference is certain difference. One is the type of catalyst. Please click next. One is type of catalyst. Here, in chemical fuel cell, only chemical catalysts are used, but, but in biofuel cell, mainly two types of catalysts are used. Either it is an enzyme or it's a microbial cells. If it is enzyme, then the fuel cell is called enzymatic biofuel cell. And if it is a bacteria or other microorganism, that is called microbial biofuel cell. Now, as far as the fuel is concerned, this uh, biofuel cell has accommodate a large various type of fuels. So long its catalyst work, it, it can accommodate both renewable as well as non-renewable fuels. Whereas in chemical fuel cell, the number of fuel, type of fuels are limited. Of course, in chemical fuel cell, also renewable fuels can be used like methanol and ethanol. But the number of uh, the research on using the fuels in chemical fuel cells are so long, it is not very high as compared to the biological fuel cell. Now, operating temperature in biological fuel cell is mostly in a room temperature. And the working piece is around physiological piece or neutral piece. Now, if you see all these parameters which are involved in biological process, can't you say that it is really a green technology? Now, we want to focus it, this biofuel cell as a sensor application for sensor development. This biofuel cell can also be used as a power supply for standalone operation as well as for sensor applications. But in my today's talk, I'll be focusing mainly its application as a sensor application. Now, as a sensor application, it has mainly two major advantages on operation. It is a self-power because it produces power itself. 
you need not have to supply a power from external sources in case of parametric bias sensors however you have to apply a power from external sources but here you need not have to apply any power from external sources the power will be generated in the system itself and the power which will be generated in the system itself itself is a response either in the form of potential or in the form of current second thing is that it has both provision turn on and turn off features because if your target of interest itself is a fuel then once you give this target to the sample then what happens your current or the signal will be amplified or increased and if the compound which you try to detect it is inhibitor of the enzymes or microorganisms which is present in the electrode then in that case your current will go down because that will inhibit the activity of the enzymes or microorganisms this uh, concept of biofuel cell is not new it was actually developed in started from 1911 none other than a botanist professor the professor was basically a botanist and when he was studying the microbial decomposition of organic uh, compound using some bacteria he observed some electrical effect and since then the concept of producing current or power from biological sources started next slide please so now as i have already mentioned that we are focusing this biofuels sensor applications so when we would like to focus it for sensor applications obviously our one of the major objective is to scaling it down because smaller the size there are many many advantages are there one of the advantage a major advantage is obviously the cost the economic uh, feasibility because when you reduce the size material requirement will be less it will be portable and many other advantages are there but specifically for biofuels there are certain advantages emerge one is that ohmic resistance is drastically decreases why ohmic resistance decreases because when you scaling it down then the distance between this electrode is also reduced so proton from that anode can be diffusively reached to the cathode comfortably there will be no loss of proton in between so ohmic resistance is decreases sensitivity increases as because it is a smaller size reactivity that sensitivity increases response time decreases and occurs high mask high mass flux density per unit area as because it is small small amount of sample itself can, can cause a high flux density of the fuel per unit area of the simple then that can be best explained by these equations i am not going detail about that please go to the next slide so as far as that application of the biofuel cell is concerned obviously at the beginning the focus was to use it as a stand alone power supply and then it was thought that this biofuel cell could be used for various kind of implantable devices currently various kind of implantable devices are used in a human body like pacemakers drug pump insulin pump a neurostimulator hearing device and so many things currently all these chemical batteries are used but chemical batteries have some lifetime because maximum lifetime of a chemical battery is at 10 years maximum so the concept of our here is that if biofuel cell can be implanted in the body and then biofuel cell can take the energy from the blood itself because blood contains a huge amount of glucose the glucose can provide up to 16 kilowatt per gram of the per gram glucose so the amount of the energy which is available in the blood in the form of a uh, glucose is sufficient to run various kind of implantable devices to power various kind of fuel cell for various applications then to run a biofuel cell in a cathodic reaction we need oxygen so oxygen level in blood is about 200 micromol per liter that is also more than enough so no battery leakage or poisoning is also involved here so with this concept this uh, research was started for many years ago but then ultimately at 2010 it was practically demonstrated that this is feasible implantable application of biofuel cell for implant for running that implant implantable devices is feasible so it was demonstrated in 2010 in red which produces about 24.4 microwatt ml per ml of the body fluid and which is better than the pacemaker requirement so since then many development happens one after another but what i am displaying over here these are mainly for power application and today my discussion is not on the application of the power but for sensor so i'll be talking on sensor only please go to the next slide so one of the major breakthrough 
of using biofuel cell for sensing devices is wearable biosensors, you might have heard that Google contact lens. The contact lens or the contact lens itself, the enzyme can be mobilized and develop a fuel cell. So one act as a cathode, bilirubin oxidase, and another is cellobios dehydrogenase. So cellobios dehydrogenase oxidizes the glucose, which is present in the lacrimal fluid. So this uh, then amount of the power which is generated, that uh, is sufficient to probe the presence, the amount of the glucose present in the body fluid. The signal can be transmitted by various electronic wireless technology like RFID. So the, so the amount of the lacrimal fluid is required to run the system is normally what is using out from our present in our uh, eyes are sufficient. <laughs> you need not, we need not have to we, to secrete that lacrimal fluid to power this uh, biofuel cell. Okay, so this was the very important uh, uh, advancement on the area. Please, next slide. So afterwards, there are many development. Then interestingly, the next development was to develop the tattoo. You might know the tattoo that young people nowadays use the tattoo in their different bodies. So this biofuel cell, enzymatic biofuel cell can be uh, implanted on a skin surface in the form of a tattoo. And then, uh, but uh, for using on the skin surface, one of the things is that this biofuel cell device should be stretchable because our muscle movement is there. Otherwise, that biofuel cell will be aberrant and it will not work. So afterwards, the technology has been developed and that gives then the flexible biofuel cell for implanting on the surface of that skin was also developed in 2016. Then uh, afterwards, there are many developments. I did not uh, display it here, all these things. So there's a lot of development, particularly these are used mainly for detection of various kind of body analytes, which are secreted through our, through our uh, sweat, like lactate, glucose, urea, and all these kind of things. And based on that, Physiological condition of a person can be probed. Go to the next slide, please. So one of the major advance, advancement and requirement, wearable biosensor for elderly care. This is one of the very important healthcare applications of the biosensors, particularly biofuel cell-based biosensors. So here, the ours is that nowadays, you see, uh, for example, in our country, we have a huge number of youth. But after some many years, I mean, all these youth will be converted to a senior citizen, right? So now there will be a major healthcare issue when a person develops to a senior citizen. So in that case, now we are also becoming moving to our industrial countries. So who will look after the parents who will be in our house? We have to stay most of the time in our office. So if some kind of skin or sensors can be developed and invented on the surface of that body, whether it is a senior citizen or <clears throat> some uh, disabled persons, various kind of physiological response sensors, again, various kind of physiological response can be developed. So all these response, this, you know, the sensors can be strapped on the surface of that body. And from there, by using this internet the thing, this is the electronic technology, as you know well. So through that, the sensor signal can be transmitted emergency, family, or clinicians, and then you can get the response or therapeutic in intervention immediately. So everything without much in human intervention, the signal from that person can be transmitted to different locations where it is required, and then immediately the therapeutic interventions can be prescribed. So this is one of the major advan advancements as far as the application of biofuel cell is concerned. Go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So now I am coming to an important point, the bioelectronics of the bioelectron. Now, whether it is a biofuel cell or it is an amperometric biosensors, in both these cases, the common requirement is the bioelectron. Now, this bioelectron may be, it may be an enzyme electron or it may be a microbial-based electron. Now, whatever may be the bioelectron, the most important requirement, please click next. So uh, common requirement uh, common requirement is the facile electron exchange between electrode and reaction. So important thing is that when this biorecognition element will interact with the substrate of interest or the target of interest, then there will be some reactions will be there. 
Now, this reaction will generate the electrons or that will consume the electrons. How, if it is consumed, then electron will have to be come from electron. If it generates the electron, then electron will have to be go to the electron. So in this, both these cases, the most important critical issue is that how these electrons exchange takes place between the base electrode and the biological molecules where reaction will take place. Better the electron exchange, better the sensitivity, and the uh, low activation of our potential. So this is the major requirement. How to understand that thing? How yes. We can look back to the nature because lesser, nature is very amazing. There might have some mechanisms because in a natural system, also flow of electrons are there. Go to the next slide, please. Well, we have got the inspiration from nature. What is that inspiration? If you see the cellular system, whether it is a bacterial cell, human cell, or plant cell, there is a flow of electrons. Where there is a flow of electrons, for example, in case of bacteria or mammalian cells, you might have heard that mitochondria, right? Oxidative phosphorylation chain. So in the oxidative phosphorylation chain, the electrons are moved from one complex to the another complex in the form of a electromotive force. So electromotive force is nothing but this electromotive force is creating an electrical conductance. And the current is already there in the biological system. If you look at the plant system, in a photosynthetic machinery also, similar kind of electrical flow current is there. Now, if you see the electron transfer rate in mammalian cell or bacterial cell or photosynthetic cells, you, you will be amazed to know that electron transfer rate is exceedingly high, about 10 to the power 13 per second. So that means in nature, of electron from one molecule to the another molecule from one system to the another system is already there and at and that is also very minor. Go to the next slide, please. So it is not only inside the cell. Natural system can pass out the electron to the environment. One of the good examples is that there are many bacteria, it has been found that bacteria can pass out their electron to the surrounding environment. For example, here I am citing one example that geobacter metal reducing. This kind of bacteria are generally present in metallic environment where it, it, it pass out the electron from its body to some kind of wire. These wires look like fresilla, but not fresilla, these are termed as nanowire. So through that nanowire, that bacteria can flush out that electron to the surrounding environment. But the question is that why this bacteria flush out that electron to the surrounding environment? So in the surrounding, basically in natural system, all the organisms, the life form, one of the major objective of the life forms is that the survival. So basically when bacteria grows in those kind of uh, hostile environment, then it tries to develop an environment which is congenial for its growth. So if there is too much of ores are here, for example, iron tree compounds are here, then it flushes out that electron to iron tree and an iron tree will be converted to ferrous system. Then this ferrous system it can take it back as its micronutrient. So there are several motifs of the natural systems, those we could not understand so far. But what we have understood is that this in a natural system also, there is an me efficient mechanism for transferring the electrons from its cellular system to the outside environment. So that means if that is the thing, that means that mechanisms also, we can think of implanting these things in a in a parametric or in a biofuel cell technological devices. Go to the next slide, please. So now I was talking about the biofuel cell. Now, if you see, we have seen that the electron transfer mechanisms is already here inside the cell and outside the cells. But I was not talking about whether biofuel cell is there or not. Now, interestingly, we can find out that biofuel cell or the fuel cell concept is also already in the nature. For example, if you see the mitochondria, in a mitochondria, this oxidative phosphorylation chain is there. If you see the function of that oxidative phosphorylation chain, in one terminal, NADAC is oxidized. The NADAC which is formed, it is formed as the result of the product which we use as a food. For example, if we use glucose or acetate or whatever it may be, then ultimately those compounds are converted to NADAC in a citric acid. One cycle is there that is called citric acid cycle or TCS cycle. In the TCS cycle, the NADAC is formed, and this NADAC is oxidized to NAD. It produces a electrical current and at the same time a proton movement. So one is 
conduction of electron, other is the conduction of the proton. So this proton is basically used to synthesize the ATP. To synthesize the ATP, a proton motive force is required, and for that, it generates an electromotive force. And that electromotive force is generated by a very unique mechanism. What is that mechanism? It used mainly, particularly for aerobic organism, it used oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. Now, oxygen, if you see the reduction potential of the oxygen, it is about plus 0.82 volt. Now, oxidation potential of NADH is about minus 0.32 volt. So this difference of these two potentials is about 1.14 volt. So this electron motive force which is generated over here to produce that proton motive force, the potential which is generated is about 1.14 volt, and that potential is sufficient to produce this ATP from that system. So this is nothing but the fuel cell concept. You know, one side that oxygen is reduced, and the other side that substrate is oxidized. The way it acts like an anode in this terminal, and the other terminal, it acts as a cathode. So this fuel cell concept is also already in the nature. Please ne click next. Now, what is our aim? Our aim is to transfer this electron, which is generated as a result of the electron motive force, to the electron from the cellular system. Now, this is the thing. So now, uh, the challenge over here is that this mitochondria, or in the cellular system, the cell wall is very thick. Go to the next slide, please. So if you see the cellular system, the cell wall is about 40 to 60 nanometer in thickness. So under this thickness, the electron will move out from inside the cell to the outside the cell to the electron. It is not feasible. Now, similarly, if we use enzyme on the surface of that electron, from the redox center of the enzyme to the electron, the distance is quite a few nanometer, a few angstrom. So that, uh, it will be more than 30 angstrom. So under this distance, how this electron will hope and transfer from this redox center to the electron? So basically, this is the major challenge. If we want to use this natural catalyst to generate the electron on the electron, this is the point for pondering. But there is some solutions. Go to the next slide, please. So there are two solutions earlier. Basically, how you develop the electron. One type of electrode is called second generation bioelectrode, and the another type of electrode is called third generation bioelectrode. Now, in the first, in the second generation bioelectrode, what it is done, one electron transfer mediator is used. Some chemical compound is used. That chemical compound it settles the electron between the redox center of the ions and the electron. Click next, click. <coughs> so I am just showing here a typical example. Suppose if you want to detect glucose. Using glucose oxidase enzyme, that glucose oxidase is basically an FAD based enzyme. Its redox center contains FAD. Now, normally, if you just implant that glucose oxidase on the surface of that electrode, it does not generate any electrical response. Now, when you use one electron transfer mediator, this is what, what it is used. One compound is called ferrocene. This ferrocene is used as electron transfer mediator. So, this ferrocene. It transfers the electrons from the redox center of the enzymes to the electrode so long the substrate glucose will be there. So with this concept, the second generation bioelectrode has been developed, and many of the glucose biosensors which is available in the global market are based on this principle only. But then this, uh, although this technology is in place, but there are one of the major disadvantages of this technology is that the mediator which is in the interface are susceptible to lease out to the electrolyte of the system. As a result of that, the operational stability of the system goes down. So there is a thought that how to overcome these challenges. The next thought is that, well, instead of that mediator, is it not possible to develop the direct electrical communication between the redox center of the enzyme and the electron? Well, that concept has come to the Puitias with the development of nanoscience and technology. There are many highly conductive nanomaterials like gold nanoparticles. If these are used along while immobilizing the enzyme or cell on the surface of the electrode, due to the comparable size of the highly conductive nanomaterials, they can mediate the transfer of electron from the redox center of the enzymes or cellular system to the electrode and generate the response current. Next slide, please. So this is the third generation bioelectrode. So there are certain advantages of the third generation bioelectrode. The one advantage is that the direct electron transfer goes hands in hand with the turnover number of the enzyme. Because whenever you use enzyme, uh, 
uh, there is one term it is called turnover number that means how many uh, number of substance can be converted to product or oxidized in the particular time frame that is generally in a simple language that is called turnover number so this number of substance converted and the number of electron transferred can be synchronized by using the direct electron transfer three generation by electron then no polarization potential of a high specific current and a biosensor sensitivity as yes, because you are working at the potential of the redox center of the enzyme so potentials are generally less at less less potential low potential the interference from the surrounding interfering compounds will be less because that potential will not influence the oxidation or reduction of the other compound which is present in a sample system then higher operational stability uh, the higher operational stability of the device so that will also give a good operational stability because here no mediators if mediator is used then only problem will arise then suitable in open environment as because there is no mediator you can use this system even even in an open environment there will be no problem but apart from developing that electrical communication between the enzyme and the electrode there are some other issues also need to be taken into account one of the important issues is that you will have to stabilize the enzymes on the surface of that electrode because biological system one of the major challenges is that the stability of the biological system and the sound in the external environment is basically less so how to improve the stability of the biorecognition element of the surface of the electrode is one of the major issue and the second issue is that when enzyme will be there on the surface of the electrode the substrate interest which is in the sample solution should not have any diffusional barrier to reach the redox center of the enzymes so that means there are three issue we must take into account while developing a bioelectron one is that free flow electron exchange between the redox center or the cell to the electron second is the stability of the biorecognition element on the surface of the electron third is the pre diffusional movement of the target of interest of the substrate between the biomolecular biorecognition element and the electron so to address this issue here comes the advanced material which are uh, is of utmost importance go to the next slide please so as far as the advanced materials are concerned these advanced materials are used for different purpose some advanced materials are used for developing uh, electrical communication between the redox center of the enzymes and the electrode as i have already mentioned sometimes these advanced materials are also used to stabilize the enzymes and some to develop the matrix on the surface of the electrode for free diffusional movement of the substrate to the electrode so there are different kind of advanced materials are used already i have mentioned that conductive materials are there please click next so one of the advanced material is as you know i think we discussed about the graphene there are various kind of graphene are there graphene are basically honeycomb structures and there are different physical forms are there some are single wall carbon nanotube double wall carbon nanotube multi wall carbon nanotube that can be molded in a form of nano forest as because when you do that thing the surface area of this nano materials will be drastically increase when surface area will be drastically increase more number of enzymes or more biorecognition element could be mobilized on the surface of the electron another important thing is that biomaterial these biomaterials particularly steel chitosan and there are various kind of biomaterials are emerging recently this main advantage of using these biomaterials for developing the third generation bioelectro is that they can stabilize this bioelectron element on the surface of the electron so apart from that there are various kind of polymers are used highly conductive polymers like penny polypropylene and various kind of composite nano and mesoporous materials are also used Uh, it is difficult to cover everything over here in the short discussions so but these are the materials that plays very critical role in developing the third generation bioelectrode particularly for to address this three so one is that electrical exchange between the biomaterial to the electron second is the stability of the bioelectron element on the surface of that electron and third is the diffusional movement of the substrate to the electron next slide please now just i would like to little bit and turn to the technical detail of the subject now what is electron transfer rate when we talk about the exchange of electron between the biomaterial and the electron or non biomaterial on the electron does not matter whether it is a biomaterial or non biomaterial electron exchange between these two entity how best that can be explained the theory behind this principle that can explain best the concept 
is called Marcus electron transfer theory. So if you see this Marcus electron transfer theory, a simple equation can be derived out of that, and that explains the electron transfer rate. The electron transfer rate is basically depends on a couple of factors. One is that the distance between the two terminals where this electron exchange is taking place. Second thing, obviously, as you know, well, the free energy of the reactions. And third is the reorganization energy of the reactions. So basically, as far as the free energy is concerned, the free energy is also can be correlated with the applied potential. Now, in, in case of amperometric devices, we apply bias potential. That bias potential is thus related to the free energy of the reaction by these equations. So more the potential you are applying, more negative will be the free energy of the reactions. And more the negative of the free energy of the reactions, this negative negative will be positive. It will give more electron transfer rate constant. So basically, if we look all these issues, then two important things come into the picture. One is the distance between these two terminals for exchange of the electrons, and other is the driving force. And as far as the driving force is concerned, in case of amperometric biosensors, it is the bias potentials we are applying. This is the driving force. And the, as far as the fuel cell is concerned, the driving force is self-generated for the electrochemical reactions, which is taking place on the surface of the delay. Next slide, please. So how this electron transfer rate constant can be determined? That can be determined by a simple principle, simple technique that is called cyclic voltammetry. I am not going detail about this technique. If some of you are interested, then you can communicate with me for knowing the detail. Generally, this technique it can be uh, examined by using a technique that is called thin film electrochemistry of protein or cell. Basically, you will have to immobilize this th a thin film of the enzymes, the biorecognition element on the surface of the electrode, and you'll have to scan in a potentiometer at a different scan rate. And from that scan rate, you will get some parameters that you will have to include in an equation. That equation is well known as the Lavaeron equation. Using the Lavaeron equation, ultimately, you will be able to calculate what is the electron transfer rate or the exchange of electron between the redox center of the enzymes or cellular system to the bioelectron. Go to the next slide, please. So I would like to briefly highlight some of the works which is going on in my laboratory. Now, initially, we tried with one enzyme that is called cholesterol oxidase, amperometric uh, sensors. Now, this cholesterol oxidase is molecular, which is about 60 kilodalton. So what we did, this uh, nanometer. So when there are the gold nanoparticles are here, the area, the enzyme immobilization of the electrode surfaces drastically increases in a uniform manner. If you see the area of enzymes immobilized, but when there is no gold nanoparticle, the enzyme mobilizations are very random. The amount of enzyme loading or the uh, loading of the biorecognition element on the surface of the electrode is haphazard and the very, very less. So that gives a very high sensitivity. Electron transfer rate is about 0.35 per second. Electron transfer rate is not very high, but whatever it may be, the amount of that, as you have already we have established, and that gives a very significant. That means that has established the direct electrical communication between the electrode and the enzymes. Next slide, please. Hello. Can you please talk after sometimes I want online meeting is being okay. with a little bit bigger enzyme that is called catalyst. The molecular weight of the catalyst is about 90 kilodalton. So, uh, uh, next click, please. So, here we have used carbon nanotube as an interfacial material. Generally, carbon nanotube, one advantage is that it is a quite long, about 0.1 to about 10 micrometer length, but diameter is in nanometer length. On the, the advantage is that the high number of docking sites are here. So, more number of enzymes can be mobilized on the surface of the electrode. So by using electrostatic principle, we have immobilized the enzyme on the surface of the electrode, and we have developed that electron transfer rate constant about more than one. So it is a quite good enough, and that electrode we have used as a hydrogen peroxide sensing. Next slide, please. So next, we tried again bigger protein that is called alcohol oxidase. This is a homotameric flavor protein about 74 kilodalton per unit, and total molecular which is about more than 600 kilodalton. So here we have used two things. This was actually mainly we are targeting for developing biofuel cell. In anodic or cathodic, both we are using one graphite ink. 
there the graphitein basically it contains some biomaterial sericin the sericin also it is known that it has some conductive property and the enzyme stabilizing property that the graphite and sericin we are mixing and producing one ink that is called graphitein ink that already we have filed patent application that is already granted along with that we have used magnetic nanoparticles and then thereafter we immobilize this in anode alcohol oxidase and the cathode bilirubin oxidase so uh, this electron transfer rate constant we have found at 1.69 per second it's quite good so this by this concept we have developed these electrodes and we then ultimately we developed a biofuel cell please go to the next slide so here we have developed a biofuel cell six biofuel cell we developed and we put in a stack to improve this current generation is it possible to play this uh, video here Oh, it is not playing. Okay, no issue. Uh, so basically, we have developed, we have practically developed the biofuel cell, and then potential which we have found is three point one volt. This three point one volt potential is very very good, and that can be used to run any small scale electronic devices. And then uh, the current generation was stable. It was stable about forty nine days. so uh, this uh, already we have filed patent applications and now this is we are projecting as a power generating device but here our main focus is also to develop the sensor and this electrode which we have developed is a based on third generation bioelectric principle so uh, go to the next slide please okay so now to develop a sensor the main focus of my laboratory is to develop the paper based sensor platform so basically if we can implant this uh, biofuel cell the concept if we can translate to a paper based system then that will be a very small and paper has microfluidic paper has various kind of advantages the paper if you will use for developing the biofuel cell will have to develop the microfluidic system of hardet and paper as an analytical device it has certain advantages what are the advantages is that it is a rapid analysis is possible it is a less expensive cost is very very less multiplexing is potential for possible and small sample volume little or no external equipment or power because in paper fluid move through passive diffusion facility you need not have to apply external external pump the way the microfluidic fluid is to be run in others kind of platforms so here you need not have to apply any pressure pump and it is easily disposable if you use for clinical applications the sensor which will be developing by using paper for clinical or diagnostic application that can be easily disposable because disposal of that medical waste is one of the major problem here what you can do you can incinerate it and you can dispose it now the question is that how to develop microfluidic channel on the paper the microfluidic channel on the paper can be possible uh, i think uh, something is happening the slide is not appearing uh, i could not see the ppt actually some connection lost is here professor goswami and professor sahu for some problem is that please wait it will be okay okay i am online uh, oh, i think in the other side only there is some problem right the uh, problem is that there is a disconnection from control room where atul okay. uh, podwa is there okay okay i am waiting no problem so there was an uh, network issue coming in few seconds please oh sorry sir sure, no Should I ask one more question, Professor Goswami? No, yeah. no, no. Professor Sahu, at the end, please. Yes, yes. You get that card, okay? Okay, no problem.
next slide, please. Yeah, here. Yeah. So basically, uh, in the paper, uh, when we use it for any analytical device, we have to draw some microfluidic channel over here. Because if we don't draw microfluidic channel, then when you drop the sample of hard paper, it will be diffused out to the surrounding environment, and detection will be difficult because liquid will be diffused and it will move all the surroundings, all the sites in all directions. So uh, the concentration of the signal, if it is used for optical or electrochemical, will not be concentrated. So here, this uh, we have used one technique because that is called photolithography technique by using flash technique. The microfluidic channel could be created. So here I am just demonstrating using a simple ink how the microfluidic channel was created. Now, using this three uh, zone, one is the sample application zone, the starting point. Second middle portion is the reagent zone where you can incorporate the reagent, and third is the adsorbent zones. So if you click the top uh, the video, one real picture will be given. Uh, is it possible? Uh, yes. One video which is in the top side. If it is possible, you click it. Otherwise, you can bypass. It. No, no, no. Open slide. Open slide. Open slide. In the same slide, there is one in the on the top of that uh, in the left hand side on the top. One small icon is there. You might have seen. No, 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 uh, it's not opening, sir. Okay, okay, fine, fine. So basically, some videos were also there. Uh, anyway. So uh, through that video, we, we could demonstrate the detection of proteins and different kinds of compounds by developing that microfluidic channel on the paper. And uh, another important uh, constraint if you use paper is that you know paper leakage. When you drop some samples, the rear side of the paper, the uh, sample goes out. So we have also developed one technique to seal the leakage. And all these things, uh, we have uh, file patent application. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this fuel cell, biofuel cell, our one of the major, as I have already mentioned, that this one to reproduce in a paper platform. Now, while biofuel cell, if we want to reproduce in a paper platform, we find that one bacteria that is called cyanobacteria is very interesting. Because cyanobacteria, if you immobilize as a recognition element, it does not require to supply any nutrients to, on the sensor surface because it grows only with carbon dioxide, light, and minerals, and it is tolerant to high soil and organic contaminants. Generally, if you develop any sensors, then when in many samples contain high soil concentration and organic contaminants, and that may affect the recognition element. But if you use cyanobacteria, the cyanobacteria are tolerant to all those kinds of toxic compounds and hazardous compounds. So the stability of the uh, sensors will be more. So we have developed the sensor circle. And that we could use it for detection of the uh, alcohol. We have focused it for detection of alcohol, and we have found a very good response. And uh, as you have seen in the right hand side, with each drop of alcohol, each uh, injection of alcohol, there is a spike. So the spike of potential can be plotted in the form of a con in the, against the concentration of the alcohol, and we got the response curve. Next slide, please. So uh, you see, one of the major activity in my laboratory is the development of aptamers. Next, uh, click please. So aptamers are basically complement to the antibodies. Basically, it has certain advantages of our existing antibodies is that it is highly stable. But the, as far as the recognition or selectivity is concerned, it is comparable to the antibodies. So uh, next slide, please. So we have developed a couple of uh, aptamers. And two aptamers we have developed, and that we have used for developing a malaria sensor. It already we have developed by using two aptamers. These are basically DNA sequence, and the DNA sequence in a secondary form structure, it can be presented like this way. So this can specifically detect the biomarkers which is present in a malarial parasite. One biomarker is called plasmodium lactate dehydrogenase that is present in probably all malarial parasites. And against that, we have developed these aptamers. And the second aptamer, glutamate, plasmodium glutamate dehydrogenase, that can be used against plasmodium glutamate dehydrogenase. So by using these aptamers, we have developed a kit. Please go to the next slide. We have developed a simple kit. That kit can be run in a simple syringe. So using magnetic bit 
we have immobilized these aptamers on the surface of that magnetic bit, and these aptamers can capture these biomarkers which is present in the blood. And uh, it, with a reaction cocktail, if there is a malarial parasite, that it gives a pink color. And that pink color can be injected on the paper, and uh, it can it will give two many informations. One is that whether plasmodium falciparum is there or not, because plasmodium falciparum is one of the difficult parasite, as because in most cases it is found to be drug resistance. So if doctors will know that it is a this malaria is caused by plasmodium falciparum, then proper therapeutic interventions can be suggested by the doctor prescribed by the doctors. Second important thing is that it can be detected in the paper platform. So this color intensity will tell you whether particularly that malaria is there or not, and if it is there. Uh, what is the intensity, severity of the malaria that can also be detected? This uh, kit is already completed. We have filed patent applications. We have published also works. Now that we are now moving forward for clinical applications. So for clinical applications, uh, now we are now tying up with some companies for final commercial applications. Next slide, please. So I think this uh, video will not play over here. This is another kit we have developed that is formaldehyde detection kit. And uh, uh, this kit uh, already, that is also already we have developed. Now we are tying up with a company uh, in the final stage. And we are, we can detect that formaldehyde liquid form, but we'd like to incorporate gaseous formaldehyde also along with that liquid formaldehyde. And that uh, uh, we are also tying up with some companies. And uh, another kit also we have developed that is methanol detection kit, that methanol, Detection is very, very important, particularly as far as our state is concerned. I think all of you would remember a couple of years ago, there is a lot of people died in Gulaghat due to that bootleg alcohols. So in a bootleg alcohol, mostly that methanols are, uh, you know, mixed up by some scrupulous elements, uh, that businessmen. So detection of methanol has utmost importance. Uh, even there are many people died in UP and then Punjab. And the, this incident is going on in particular in developing and underdeveloped countries. So detection of methanol is very important, those kind of alcohols and other food products also. More of methanol is used in various kind of paints and methanol toxicity is very uh, difficult for human being because it can cause a lot of uh, uh, problem, health problem. So detection of methanol has a great importance. So we have also developed one methanol detection kit and then Two products, formaldehyde detection kit and methanol detection kit, was dedicated to the nation by our HRD minister the last year, February 14th, to the nation. So with this, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk. Please go to the next slide. So we have uh, written one book also on these advanced materials and techniques for biosensors and bioanalytical applications. This book is now in the global marketing platforms. Various companies are dealing with this. Uh, book. If you click Google, you will see various uh, sites are there. I have shown here four, five sites, but there are about ten sites are there who are doing dealing with this book. And this book is uh, it's a very I would suggest that it is a very useful not only for research uh, workers, but uh, for it is also useful for textbook level book for and uh, postgraduate and PhD students for their coursework because these books gives the informations about the advanced materials used for not only for biosensors, for various analytical systems, a various kind of advanced techniques, not only uh, field effect transistors or those kind of things, but also advanced electrochemical uh, systems like uh, uh, various kind of uh, luminescence-based electrochemical, electrochemical luminescence and the uh, type of things and various smart materials in book is useful both for academic as well as research purpose. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sir, uh, it is present actually. Next slide. Okay. Okay. I think that slide is up. Anyway, I'd like to acknowledge my research groups and uh, Okay, it is coming. Uh, this is, of course, the work which I presented, some of the work which I presented, not only this group, but these are the key members. I have past students. They have also enough contribution for these works. And I have collaborators also in different countries. He is Professor Meldrum from Canada, 
Alberta, University of Alberta, Professor Pedro from University of Bath, Professor Corton from Buenos Aires from Argentina, and Professor Stomart uh, Debart Stom for Hirkut State University, Russia. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and I also acknowledge the Department of Biology of the India for sponsoring uh, the, my work since 2008 in a phase-by-phase -phase manners. So I am getting the projects in the third phase now. So with this, I'd like to conclude my talk and I am thankful to all the audience who has participated in these webinars. And I'll be very, very glad if I'll, if you have any questions, I'll be very glad to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you so much, sir. So with interest of time, probably I can take uh, very few questions. Uh, first question is from me. Uh, you talked about electrodes. Yeah. Uh, for biological applications, uh, for example, if you take a signal from uh, say skin, which is very small, uh, will environment, say pressure, temperature, all this uh, affect the signal? What is the molecule you are talking about? Uh, can you please repeat? For example, this? if I take a signal from body, say through skin, okay, for for, for an electronic application, uh, say ECG or something like that. So because the signal from body is very small, uh, yeah. will the environment, uh, you know, skin conditions, etc., will affect the reading? Well, as far as those. Uh, uh, ECG or those, this is also another kind of technology. But uh, presently, what we are presenting here today is mainly amperometric and biofuel cell based sensors. So, uh, this amperometry is not uh, used for those kind of things, I think. Uh, this is a different kind of sensors. So, uh, frankly speaking, I don't have idea about uh, that body, those kind of CC kind of sensors, what. Uh, uh, so the directly bio recognition based systems. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that. Okay, okay. So th th thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, another question from a participant he is Ankit. Uh, he is asking Are all biosensors active or they may be passive also? And he also added Is active or passive nature decided by the type of transducer we use? Oh, yes, because uh, active passive means in what sense? In terms of energy, right? So if you talk about active means, that means you are you have to apply some external power, right? If there is no power, system will be self-run, then obviously we can term it as a passive kind of things because no energy input will be required. Now, as far as the temperometric sensors are concerned, you will have to apply a potential. Now, when you apply a potential, that means you are giving an input, energy input from that external sources, right? Now, if you see the biofuel cells, in case of biofuel cells, it's essentially sense generated. You will not have to apply, apply external energy to the system. So this is the basic difference. There are different kinds of uh, sensors are there. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Bora has asked, what are the different external sources for supplying energy uh, to a biofuel cell? Well, external, as far as the biofuel cell is concerned, external energy is not required. External energy means if you talk about the fuel, then only fuel will be the external energy. For example, if you want to run a biofuel cell using alcohol as a fuel, then alcohol will be the external energy. If you want to use the biofuel cell using glucose as an energy, then glucose will be the external energy. So whatever the fuel you are supplying outside, that will be the external energy. Right, right. And uh, he also added, can we create a uh, biochemical fuel cell? Well, fuel cell, basically when fuel cell is a biochemical... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mr. Goswami is asking, what is the simplest way to create a microfluidic channel on paper using readily available material, is it possible? Yes, yes. Basically, we are using one simple technique that is called flash technique, photolithography technique. So for that, you need a simple chromatographic paper and you need a chemical that is a photosensitive chemical, 
when you when you uh, expose these chemicals after putting it paper uv light or light then this molecules will be polymerized so basically when you use paper for developing any kind of sensors you will have to develop two kind of uh, uh, channel one is hydrophilic and one is hydrophobic so if your target of interest is hydrophilic the channel should be hydrophilic and surrounding environment should be hydrophobic the hydrophobic uh, um, portion can be created by using those photosensitive polymers and you need the small equipment like uh, because you will have to give some curing for curing you need to put some heat for react to react on to faster or curing this you know uh, polymers from the channel so for using simple equipment you can develop the micro i i am sure whatever the equipment you are seeing in your laboratory in the university uh, using this technique itself you can develop the microfluidic channel in a paper because only thing additional thing you need that uh, uh, that uh, photosensor that is readily available in the market and they are not very expensive also you need a simple chromatographic paper you need an uv visible spectrophotometer or just uv uh, one instrument and uh, yeah, for temperature curing you need some kind of uh, heat uh, mental heater or those kind of heating system that's all okay uh, thank you so much sir uh, with the interest of time uh, participants we are not uh, taking any other questions but uh, you can send us the questions so that uh, we can send to professor gusami sir and uh, so thank you so much sir for your time and have a very nice and interesting talk so hopefully uh, our students will be uh, benefited because we have a uh, mtech program in bioelectronics so some of the topics janavi uh, are covered in classes so i'm sure they will be benefited from your talk thank you so much okay thank you and if possible uh, is it possible to get the recorded video yeah sure 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 i will send it to you okay thank you very much thank you so much okay. so uh, dear participants we are at the end of the program both of thanks so on behalf of the conveners of the webinar dr rupam and professor sharma i express deep sense of gratitude to all the speakers of the webinar professor saha from santa clara university us professor sohan from iit kanpur in the first session Professor Mahabatra from IIT Bangalore, Professor Goswami from IIT Guwahati in the afternoon session, for their insightful talks and discussions with participants directly or indirectly on various aspects of micro and nano electronic devices and sensors. We are thankful to all the participants who joined us today from different parts of the globe. We are sure the talks will help you. in your studies and research and ever thank you five chancellor tespur university for addressing the participants thanks are due to professor sinha and professor fuya for sharing the sessions thank you all for making the one day webinar successful have a safe stay thank you all Okay then I am logging it out Uh-huh, I'm gonna...